Okay, Matt, looks like you're up now. Yep, we're good to go. All right, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we are holding a special city council meeting for the purpose of reviewing the proposed budget that we will be discussing here shortly uh, from the city staff. The purpose of this morning is to see the budget proposal for 2021 to receive feedback from the Westminster City Council members and then return with an updated proposal on October 2nd, I believe, Chris, right? For the purpose of the, to make sure we have the record correct, uh, I'll do a quick roll call of the council members. Uh, Don and his staff will present uh, as they need to. So for the record, Councilor DeMott, you're present. Yes, sir. Councilor uh, Seymour. Yes, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Sykes. Yes. Councilor Scully. Yes. Councilor Smith. Yes. And Councilor Bowles. Yes. All right. Uh, Councilor, with uh, if you will, make sure your mics are on mute unless you need to talk. We'll use the same process we do for requesting to speak. Put it in the uh, chat box and we'll know to call on you. We have a very long day planned. Uh, I will try to give you a short break at least once an hour. If someone needs one sooner, just drop me a message the way you normally do. Other than that, uh, Mr. Lindsay, I understand you're going to start us off and then uh, turn it over to the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I'll, I will answer your question uh, on the schedule momentarily. We've got a slide that's going to go through that. So um, I'm sorry, I was not quick enough to the draw on my, on my mute button there. Um, good morning, everyone. It is a uh, pleasure to see you all bright and early on a Saturday morning. Uh, and we appreciate you all uh, taking the time out of your weekend and the last couple of days to uh, read through the budget information that we have uh, we have provided. Um, we've got a group of staff that's on the line this uh, this morning um, and for the day that's going to go through um, a chunk of information with you uh, to leave plenty of time to uh, have a discussion um, on uh, a number of priorities um, and possibilities within this within this budget. Just to, just to give um, brief introductions, I think you know the city manager's office team. Um, but uh, Barbara Opie, Larry Dorr, and Jody Andrews, the deputy city managers, are on the call this morning. Um, myself, assistant city manager, Chris Lindsay, um, and then Dee Martin, the human resources director, uh, is with us and will be going through a bit on total compensation. And then I wanted to mention the members of my team who you will see um, on and off, uh, on and off throughout the day. Um, just uh, just to give you a heads up, so Fred Kellum will be joining us, Teresa Boko, Michael Parlo, John Prasner, and Seth Plass. Um, Seth Plass is not one you normally see as, as uh, part of our team, but Seth, um, is a, Seth is a capital projects administrator in the engineering division and community development. Um, he, he volunteered to take on a temporary assignment this year and help us with the development of the capital plan. Um, and when he volunteered, that was pre-COVID um, and things took quite a turn um, and uh, he has done great work throughout the year. Um, so so um, he's been pulling pulling double duty and he'll be presenting the, the capital plan information to us today. Um, so with that, we're gonna set up a little bit more, but I wanted to turn it over to city manager Don Tripp uh, first this morning to uh, kick us off. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to be really brief, and uh, I want to first of all thank you uh, to the staff, uh, to the mayor, to the mayor pro tem, and all of you city council members for your preparation for today, uh, for the time you're going to spend today, uh, for the, um, I'm, I'm sure, fruitful feedback that we'll receive, and for <clears throat> the teamwork that, that I, I know we will have moving forward. Um, on behalf of our citizens and our, our, our residents in our, in our city to uh, deliver a balanced budget for 2021. Um, you know, my role, according to the charter, according to the, to the code, is to present to you uh, 
a budget for your deliberation and then for you uh, to make a decision as to uh, how, what you want that uh, final budget to contain. Uh, this is really the start of that process today, but it's many, many miles down the road for a number of staff that have spent significant time on this. Uh, the representatives of those staff are here today to answer questions and clarify and take notes moving forward so we can adjust and amend uh, on your on your on your uh, input today. In order to provide the staff some direction, uh, this year I developed a set of guiding principles for them. So the guiding principles that you see in my letter and which will be presented later on, those are items that I wrote. They've been edited uh, by the staff um, uh, and they made a couple of additions, but I'm, I feel really good about those. And this was a guide rail really for the staff to use in determining in this very difficult and, and most challenging of times how to set priorities and how to present this in a way that continued to deliver what I believe to be uh, the charter requirements of my position. Um, I'm actually very pleased today to present to you a balanced budget. Uh, we sit here today uh, with a budget presented to you that's balanced. Certainly it's not exactly, um, and we expect it to not be exactly where we'll be at the end, but at least you've got a beginning point uh, that provides a balance. It is balanced because we were because we made some capital reductions that were thoughtful and again around those guiding principles. We made departmental reductions. We went to the individual departments uh, and and spent many hours talking with them about where they believed uh, for a year in 2021 they could make some reductions. Line of business changes throughout the organization that saved money and through a use of the general fund stabilization reserve and you'll hear an awful lot about that today for members of the public that may be listening the city has two general uh two uh general reserves this particular one is developed for exactly these times in history uh when we need these funds and uh, i'm pleased to say that uh, that reserve has doubled over the last five years so uh we have adequate reserves um, to balance this budget for you today so with that I really like to turn it back to uh, to Chris and Larry and the team. And again, I, I can't emphasize enough how much we appreciate all of you uh, and your commitment to our city. Thank you, Mr. Tripp, uh, Mayor and City Council members, uh, Larry Dorr, Deputy City Manager and Chief Financial Officer. I wanted to go through uh, just our approach to today's meeting as a staff and the things that uh, we have outlined for you here today. And, and really, this is your time to work on the budget. Uh, this is your uh, opportunity to be thinking about and giving direction for your policy as a, as a city council for the Westminster community. But we need to begin with sharing some information with you. On July 26th, so much has changed since the, our last uh, all day discussion about the city's budget and finances. If you hearken back to that, you recall that uh, the response to the public health crisis was just sort of cracking a valve. We had just uh, gotten some uh, liquor restrictions across uh, the state of Colorado, and there was uh, even more volatility than we see today. Since that time, uh, and due to your adoption of an extended budget deadline, uh, we've been able to continue to analyze our revenues, and put some time behind us uh, in reaching this current level of economic activity. So we want to share some information with you about that and about some of the choices that uh, we collectively have to uh, maintain a balanced budget and begin to transition from a city manager's proposed budget to a city council's adopted budget. So we have much information to share with you as, as to what's gone into uh, today's proposed budget. But I want to let you know that these presentation slides are really uh, just a higher level of the details to what's presented in your binder. We don't have, generally speaking, with just a couple of exceptions, we don't have any new information in the slides that isn't presented in the budget binder. But we'll continue to refer uh, to points in the binder as to where uh, what we're discussing so that you can appropriately take notes, make comments, and give direction later on in today's uh, meeting. Um, we want to answer your questions, of course, uh, and, and let me just kind of divide that into two areas, if I might. Uh, certainly throughout the presentation, if you have questions about any uh, acronyms or any jargon that we've used, please stop us right there and we'll be glad to uh, explain those. And we attempt to avoid those kinds of things so that uh, we can be understanding both to you or understood both to you and to members of the public. 
if you're confused on any of the dates or any of the numbers on the slides, please stop us and we'll, we'll make sure that those uh, dates and points of information are not confusing. So please, uh, we invite you to do that. However, uh, please, uh, I think if you uh, hold your thoughts about policy and direction and a holistic approach to this third bullet point in the slide, uh, our goal today is to spend at least half, if not more of our, of, if not more than that, of our total time receiving your work, receiving your input, your direction, your policy choices as a council. Uh, again, as I said at the top, this is your opportunity uh, to do council's work on the budget for the Westminster community. So uh, unlike uh, our last meeting where we really needed to provide information in response to the public health crisis and financial crisis, this should feel a little bit different today with an opportunity for each of you to provide those uh, policy inputs and directions. So um, uh, based on that, we, we anticipate, uh, as was mentioned a moment ago, that uh, this will identify some next steps uh, and some areas for future research uh, choices and alternatives, and that will hopefully be an outcome of our meeting today. With that, Mayor and Council, I just want to check in and make sure that this is going to meet your expectations uh, for the day and is generally uh, in agreement uh, with what you had hoped to see uh, for your work as a city council on the budget. And I, I just should also say thank you. I appreciate uh, some thumbs up or a thumbs down if it, you'd like to see something else. Uh, and I will be monitoring the chat as will the mayor in terms of any questions or comments that comes up that come up, any details as will uh, Assistant City Manager uh, Chris Lindsay, so that we're sure to answer uh, any of those questions you have along the way. So thank you for that feedback. I'm glad that we're generally on target and I'll be monitoring our progress and pace throughout the morning so that we can ensure that council has significant time uh, for this bullet point to number three. So with that, I too wanna to give thanks to Assistant City Manager Chris Lindsay and his entire team across not just policy and budget, but all of our departments and all of those who have been involved in this very challenging budget process uh, who've contributed to the many uh, opportunities, the many challenges, and uh, hopefully a successful and productive outlook uh, for the future for Westminster. I, I just couldn't possibly list all the names, uh, but it's a it's a significant uh, team and uh, a lot of uh, dedication uh, and creativity uh, toward uh, putting forth this budget, this city manager's proposed budget. So with that, Mr. Lindsay, would you uh, describe in more detail uh, the, the agenda for mayor and council? Thank you, Mr. Tour. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, within that framework of uh, expectations that uh, Larry just set up for us um, this morning, what we're going to go through is um, the budget process, uh, just a, a little overview of the remainder of our, our budget process, um, an update on where we are uh, year to date with the financials, um, then an update on, on taking that year to date financials and forecasting it through the rest of 2020. Um, when we get through 2020, we're gonna start on 2021, uh, looking at uh, the 2021 revenue gap, and then how to close that gap. And then we're gonna end with um, with a productive conversation around feedback and next steps, like Larry just but, discussed. Mr. Lindsay, it, it doesn't seem that my question was registered in the chat or notice. So before, before we go through everything, I just wanna, um, I didn't, I wanna make sure that I totally followed what Deputy City Manager Dorr was, um, saying that how we'll go through the day. So you guys want to cover the slides and if we have questions specific to what you're explaining, ask those. But if we have um, input as far as like our direction, you would prefer that we hold that direction until the end of the, the presentation. Um, and then I assume the other question I had, and then I'll let you guys continue on, but I wanted to clarify that. But then also you spoke about our, our last meeting back in April. And so there was some input given. And I know that obviously not everybody who was at that, that last meeting are the people who are actually making some of the proposed cuts or changes or ads or whatever. So how does, my other question is, how does that information that we gave feedback in April, because there were specific things that we said were priorities to each of us, um, how was that flowed down to the departments that gave input into the budget?
Councillor Devon, let me go ahead and uh, first uh, take care of a logistical uh, matter. I, I'm looking at the chat at the moment, and I'll just ask Mr. Williams to ensure that uh, we have the proper organizers and panelists and so forth, sir. I apologize. I don't see a comment from you, uh, and I'll just quickly check at uh, which audience that was uh, sent to, so I beg your pardon. Uh, so we'll get that logistic tidied up because we do want to welcome your comments and feedback. I think you I think you mentioned both the April, you were referring both to the April and to the July uh, meetings of the city council related to the budget. And I can tell you that uh, our executive leadership team has uh, been engaged and reviewed and been involved in all of those comments from council and took all of those considerations into shape. And I think that those will begin to reveal themselves as we get into the next steps uh, or into the later part of the presentation, I think that involved quote unquote, how to fill the gap uh, in terms of uh, changes in, in uh, all manner of uh, business operations and um, utilization of reserves, things that city manager Tripp uh, described just real briefly in his opener. So uh, to answer your question, yes, along the way, if there are any acronyms, jargon, uh, any number of questions on the slide, please uh, please interrupt us. And again, we'll I'll test the chat here in just a moment uh, to make sure that that's functioning okay. Um, and it seems that Mr. Williams has described that. Uh, Councillor DeMont, I think uh, he, he mentions oh, here that you're... It looks like I went to staff instead of all, I think is why you didn't see it, but... Okay, all good there. Uh, and, but uh, as, you, as you put it, uh, to the extent that you have uh, policy uh, positions, comments, points of view, or recommendations, I think it would be best to do that uh, at the end of the presentation because you'll have a holistic view of all of the different uh, inputs that have gone into it. So hopefully that answered your question there. Yep. And yep. Uh, uh, we'll uh, just double check the chat here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, and thanks for the clarification. Um, so that's the agenda we've prepared for the day. Logistics wise, the mayor already covered a bit of this, but but staff is prepared to uh, to go until 3.30 this afternoon. Um, we've scheduled time at roughly noon for a 30 minute lunch. Um, and then as the mayor said, uh, bio breaks, uh, bio breaks as needed, just let him know. In his introduction this morning, uh, Don mentioned the budget guiding principles. Um, these are uh, guiding principles that, that Don set forth with staff and our executive leadership team in the development of the 2021 proposed budget um, in response to the decline in revenues and the need to align our spending within the city's available um, resources. Um, staff seeks to and has sought to follow these and consider these during the deliberation of um, many, many difficult choices um, throughout this uh, budget development process. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these. Um, they are in your binders and the budget message. Let's talk through the budget process. Um, and I'm going to start out with maybe a little more of logistical information. Um, so this is the, uh, just talk briefly about the binders um, that you all have um, and the information. That's the same information that's been posted to uh, the public. Um, What's contained in here is uh, the budget message from city manager Don Tripp, um, a revenue and expenditure summary. That revenue and expenditure summary includes a total picture of all the city's funds. Um, then there's a breakdown of each fund within the city's fund structure. There's a schedule of all transfers of funds that go between, um, transfers of monies that go between individual funds. Um, and then at the back of that, there's also a debt schedule um, for those debt payments for long-term obligations that the city, the city pays. Uh, there's an operating budget summary that contains much of the information uh, we're going to go through today. Uh, there's information on the Human Services Board uh, recommendations. Since council has already reviewed those, um, we're not planning to review those again uh, during the day today. Um, the capital improvement section is a very critical section, um, and I just want to give you a, a little bit of um, a, a, just a little bit of clarification for those that have seen this before. Um, we showed the capital projects sorted both by department and by fund, um, so you will see projects listed multiple times. Um, there's actually an asterisk if they're funded from multiple funding sources, um, but just in case you see them multiple times. 
um, we wanted to we wanted to give uh, everyone you know multiple opportunities to see the information um, the best way that works for them. So you'll see them sorted by fund and by department. Um, and then lastly, in the in the um, binders and in the um, proposed budget document um, are the listing of community requests that have been received um, to date um, with uh, staff analysis and staff recommendations behind those. Getting back to the mayor's question when we first started, um, the city staff is proposing um, the following schedule for the rest of our budget development uh, cycle. Um, first would be a pu public, public budget hearing on September 28th. Um, then we'd have a follow-up study session on October 5th. Uh, that allows uh, staff time to follow up on uh, any items, further discussion, uh, more explanation um, or exploration on anything that comes up at today's session. Um, staff is also prepared to hold a budget public hearing on October 26th. Uh, that one will be in City Hall. Um, staff is proposing to um, adopt the budget on November 23rd. Um, a week earlier than the deadline of November 30th um, that was set per the emergency ordinance, um, just to give us a little a little extra time. And I would clarify um, that adoption will be first reading of the budget on on November 23rd. Um, and I just want to emphasize as you as you see the dates, um, staff is prepared to um, expand upon these dates, add more sessions as we go through. Um, and really, I think that's a point we're going to make throughout the presentation today. Um, what is in uh, the budget we see as a starting point, really. We expect a number of changes to happen between now and um, adoption in late November. Um, we're getting revenue information every month. Um, we got updated revenues on uh, Tuesday of this week. Um, so we, we continue to see those and then also the inputs from council uh, will allow this to continue to evolve. Um, in addition to that, I think staff believes we will continue to see this change um, into next year um, as uh, revenues increase or decrease or market conditions change. Um, we, expect, um, we expect to come back to you numerous times um, during the year um, to um, add add things back in, pull things back out of the budget, depending upon um, what the economic conditions and uh, revenue uh, revenue situation is. So really just to emphasize, this is a starting point uh, for our discussion, both for adoption, but also a starting point for a financial plan to get us through 2021. With that, we're gonna move into uh, 2020 year-to-date financial update. Um, we're going to start uh, year to date. So these are financials uh, through August, actual actual financial information uh, through August. And I'm going to involve, uh, I'm going to ask Fred Kellum to uh, step up and talk with us. Thank you, Chris. Um, and good morning, Council and, and Mayor. Um, so we're all aware that the COVID outbreak has materially impacted city finances in 2020. And as such, the table that you see up on the screen um, pretty much focuses on the funds that are most materially impacted by the COVID outbreak. It pretty much includes just about everything but the utility fund. I think the one other fund that's not on the list is Conservation Trust, and we're not really seeing any uh, negative impacts there. So um, this is just a current snapshot of where we're at. Um, as Chris mentioned, it's just year-to-date numbers through August, uh, comparing it to the same time period in 2019. So as you can see, the bottom line across all of the funds, uh, we're $6 million behind where we were at at the same time in 2019. Um, and so you will also see a few notes at the bottom. It's important to know what's included in the numbers. Um, similar to how numbers or, or comparative data is reflected in the monthly financial reports, um, the revenues exclude things like interfund transfers, grants, other, time, other financing sources, and things of that nature. And the reason why is because we want to get at the recurring revenues that the city receives, actual revenues that come into the city. 
Um, additionally, something that pops out on the screen for general capital improvement fund is it, it's not showing a, um, a decrease over 2019 at this point. And that's because in August, we actually received uh, a development fee uh, payments that came in for $1.3 million. So before that, we were behind 2019, but then we received the large payment. So that puts us in a different position for the capital improvement fund. Um, and again, I mentioned the focus is on these funds, um, but pretty soon here on one of the upcoming council agendas, you will see a more detailed um, financial report for the month of August showing all the funds. Chris. Fred, thank you. Thank you for that uh, year-to-date accounting. And we need to uh, clearly thank our finance department and our accounting team for continuing to report and track those revenues. And of course, they feed into our forecast, uh, which is what our budget and policy team are going to get into here in just a minute. This is one slide that is not in your binder uh, anywhere, uh, Mayor and Council. This is uh, uh, data that we've just developed in the last couple of days, but it, we think it's just as important as the year to date. And I'll describe it here. Uh, this is something you've seen before, but I do want to uh, report to you the August activities, which again, as I said, we were just developing the last couple of days, and so it was not uh, uh, not a part of your uh, binder, but it will be a part of this our COVID Chronicle Financial Report, which is uh, your monthly report and a supplemental related to uh, what's happening uh, due to the public health crisis and finances. So uh, while Mr. Kellum covered the city's collections relative to 2019, it should be noted that the city uh, further anticipated a growth in its revenue and experienced that in the first quarter of 2020 uh, and also made appropriations uh, against those anticipated increases. So this slide uh, further describes the city's financial position as it relates to something we've been calling our cash burn build. And as you see in the first quarter, uh, things pretty well went according to plan. Uh, there were uh, increases in revenue and uh, phasing in with some spending, so the city built its uh, cash position. Um, as time has gone on and we've experienced uh, full closures uh, in our economy from uh, stay-at-home orders and all manner of changes, you can see that obviously with the revenue declines uh, Mr. Kellum described, but also our increased spending, we have had a negative uh, cash flow seasonally adjusted uh, that's presented here. We did see some favorable activity in July, uh, not just uh, in sales tax and other revenues, uh, but also uh, we had some uh, some openings and things like this that created a little bit of revenue. However, for August, uh, we've seen a cash burn of about $2 million, uh, right on about 2.2, uh, and we'll be getting into further detail of that uh, as, uh, as we pr present the year-to-date, or excuse me, month-over-month -month financial report here in the near future, but felt that it was a it was a point in time to provide you with some information as to what's happening and brings the total cash burn as a result to a little over $8 million uh, at this point. Um, there are reasons to be hopeful. Um, this uh, involves revenues for the month of July, sales tax revenues that are then collected in August. You recall that we had some liquor sales restrictions and some cause for concern that that could have impacted the economy, but I can tell you that our sales tax activity is right on about 98% core revenues. Uh, we do have some anomalies in there uh, for August versus August cash receipts. So that gives us great uh, cause for uh, some enthusiasm. On the other hand, we have seen and we note that this is uh, one of the most active months for our recreation services and obviously we have curtailed uh, access and uh, all of those uh, kinds of things due to uh, COVID-19. Additionally, uh, we've seen significant changes and this all of these things play into our forecast on the purchase of new automobiles, uh, construction activities, business investment causing general use tax, and we'll have more comments on it. But I just want to say this about the forecast before I turn it back to Mr. Kellum. Our current state of economic activity, we believe, is probably uh, most likely for the near term. With that, we have this all important holiday shopping season right around the corner here in the fourth quarter that will be a major economic indicator of the strength and activity in the overall economy and in the Westminster economy, clearly. So the holiday shopping season due to its 
seasonality and how that drives sales tax. Uh, there's lots of uh, conjecture, a lot of speculation about how that may go. Clearly, our uh, spending patterns and our physical behavior will be evolving and changing this holiday season. Uh, it's difficult to imagine it being just as it was a year ago. But thus far, our consumers uh, in the Westminster economy have continued to spend in other areas, be it home improvement, be it in uh, clothing, gift, and jewelry, or online sales. Uh, while people may not be spending in restaurants, we're noticing that they're spending in other areas, uh, and we think that that is uh, likely to be sustained. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it back to Mr. Kellum and have him make some comments about our 2020 forecast, which again is substantially based on our on our current activity. Mr. Kellum? Mr. Doerr, before you move on, there's a question from Mayor Pro Tem Sipes. I can wait till after Mr. Kellum. Perhaps he's going to address it. Absolutely. And if there's any question on the previous slide, uh, feel free and, and uh, we can, uh, I can point to any data points. I realize that uh, sometimes the fonts can come through a little bit uh, more difficult. Uh, let me also just say about this slide, if I may, I want to give great thanks to our finance department, in particular, our director, Tammy Hitchens. This is a, this is a report that uh, we've never done before uh, as a city. This is uh, really unique in its presentation and hopefully uh, guides all of us in understanding uh, the city's financial position from month to month. So I want to just uh, give some appreciation. And uh, Mayor Pratim, I see your hand there. Yes, please. Yeah, I guess I will ask my question now. Just I'm trying to reconcile this slide with the slide before where Mr. Kellum showed us that we're only really about $6 million below um, where we were at this time last year. Um, our cash burn rate shows us at about $8 million um, below where we were last year. Um, just trying to understand that difference. Is that because of those appropriations that we did um, in March? Um, based off of, I, I'm just trying to understand that $2 million discrepancy and my apologies um, for being obtuse if it's readily avail understandable to everyone else. And then I wanted to ask, um, are inflows of cash from CARES represented and, expen and the expenditures represented in this? Thank you. Apologies. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. And let me just go into a little more detail. The bars are representative of the given month. So for August, I beg your pardon, I got it reversed. The bars are the cumulative change in cash flows. The line is for the individual month itself, if you're trying to reconcile there. And of course, we could have done that in the reverse as well. But the, the bars are the cumulative change in cash. And I think you described it, uh, frankly, yourself, which is, yes, Mr. Kellum compared revenues to revenues, but we need to account for not the appropriations in March, but the appropriations a year ago for 2020 uh, were greater uh, than in 2019. So if we did Mr. Kellum's uh, previous slide on expenditures, you would notice an increase there, of course, and that you'll recall that from a year ago. I didn't recall it, but thank you. So hence our hence our change in cash flow. But uh, these this uh, let me just say uh, qualitatively that that this feeling that we're having about our current economic circumstance and where we're going uh, plays into our forecast going forward. Mr. Kellum, thank you, Larry. Um, so we just covered where we're at 2020. Now, where do we think we're going to go out uh, be at towards year end uh, with similar types of data? So first, to better understand our process, we conduct um, a thorough monitoring of the revenues each month uh, as the month end closes. Um, and we go through line by line in every single fund in the city uh, and all the budgeted funds. And so it is a very thorough process and we do monitor this. Um, earlier in 2020, uh, when COVID, there were a lot more uncertainties around COVID and it's still uncertain, uh, but we have more data now. Uh, at the time we were using scenarios because we really didn't know. Um, it's based on different recovery patterns uh, that we think might happen, but at the time we didn't know, so we used scenarios. Um, now that we have more data and there's fewer months in the year, um, we're actually transitioning away from the scenarios for the remainder of 2020. Uh, more coming to a more singular uh, uh, number for the year end. 
in this next slide, um, basically, where do the 2020 shortfalls begin? It's revenues. This slide um, really just focuses on revenues, specific revenues that might go into different funds. The funds are noted on, on the slide. Uh, but this is revenues, like what's the impact of COVID this year? Uh, actually, there could be other impacts beyond COVID, but COVID is the biggest factor. Um, so anyway, this more focuses on the revenues themselves. Um, and then, of course, something to point out, you know, not all these revenues are impacted the same uh, from COVID. For example, sales and use tax, uh, people are still spending money. But then accommodations tax, um, you know, people aren't really going to hotels and motels very much. So accommodations tax is suffering much more than sales and use tax, uh, just as an example. Um, and so what this basically, when we take the actuals and look to year end uh, with that data that we've received the past couple of months, we believe that in these revenue categories, we believe that the, um, we'll be under collected approximately $18 million. Um, basically, that's what we think. Uh, it's a budget to year end estimated comparison for these revenue types. And then this next slide, um, this next slide, it's a different perspective, but it has a very similar result. Um, this basically shows the impacts of those revenue shortfalls on the funds that receive those revenues. Um, so these are basically year-end projections, revenue projections for the funds you see listed. Um, and so basically the, the bottom line result is fairly similar. Um, we think there's gonna be over an $18 million shortfall in those specific revenues. And then across the funds, it's very similar result. And that's because the other revenues that are collected into the these funds that you see are pretty much on track for meeting the budget. Um, and so I believe that actually is the target that we're working for uh, towards as far as estimating a potential gap for 2020. I think that leads us. Actually, thank, thank you, Fred. I would like to invite Larry to <laughs> provide a few parting comments on this slide. Thanks, Fred. I, I, I really appreciate it, sir. I just wanted to punctuate a few things for Mayor, Council, and our audience as in as to just what's gone into this revenue forecast. It's been a one revenue forecast like none other in any of our careers. We've gone down into not just the 200 lines that are most important and taking a look at uh, what they're doing. And I, I have some comments to that. By the way, we do have this at a fairly high level on page 33 in your binder. If uh, you wanted to be having a look at that and making any notes for a future discussion uh, toward the end of our uh, presentation. But I just wanted to highlight some of the bigger ones and some of the things that have gone into it. Of course, we did do our sales tax sector analysis based on some of the things that we know. We now have movie theaters uh, starting to open in Westminster and across the country. We took that into consideration. Um, and related to sales tax, as I mentioned earlier, we're noticing that our, our consumers in the Westminster economy are, are, while they may not be spending on restaurants and other, other uh, things that they're not able to do, they are spending on, as I mentioned, clothing, gift, and jewelry, uh, certainly our large big box stores and others. Um, and so that's, uh, that, that household budget has transitioned from point A to point B, but still subject to the city's sales tax. So uh, we're running at about 98% or thereabouts, and uh, we're carrying that forward. On the, in another area though, and I, forgive me, I do want to just take a couple minutes here. In general use tax, we're running at about 70%. Uh, and let me describe that. I want to make sure the audience really understands general use tax because it's really a key indicator of what businesses are spending money on. Uh, what that means is, uh, as a business, if you are a business located in Westminster and you're investing in hardware, computer hardware, furniture, fixtures, property, plant, uh, and other equipment, 
uh, and you don't pay a sales tax uh, as a business when you purchase those items. Let's say they're purchased outside of Westminster or purchased out of state and brought into Westminster, then the, the city's general use tax is assessed against those items. And by the way, the state of Colorado also has a, a general use tax, but this has been an indicator and something that we've had to look at more carefully. Uh, and while it's uh, not uh, nearly the size of the sales tax revenue, it's an important one. Furthermore, in uh, auto sales, uh, we do see uh, our consumers uh, in Westminster, and I think as you know, when, when you purchase an automobile and you reside in Westminster or you have a business in Westminster, it doesn't matter where you've purchased that automobile. It could be in purchased in Nebraska or Littleton or uh, someplace outside the city, but when you register the vehicle, either at your business or your residence, then the, the city's automobile use taxes is due and paid at the county uh, or paid at the time of purchase. Sometimes that occurs as well. We're running at about 80% there. Um, and we think that given our current environment that that could likely continue. Uh, I finally wanted to just comment on building construction use tax and that that is a, an indicator of a pretty, a pretty large sector of the economy. We're running at about 65% of our uh, historical experience. And building construction use tax is, is assessed on the materials for projects that are occurring within Westminster. So uh, lumber, concrete, uh, roofing materials, all of those kinds of things running at about 65%. And finally, uh, highway users trust or tax fund. Uh, I've, I've heard that used interchangeably, so I wanna say that. Uh, this is really related to the gasoline tax and we are running at about 80% of traditional levels uh, of traditional uh, revenues uh, on that particular source. So um, it, it, it would, it wouldn't be uh, prudent or clear to describe that there's been one set of circumstances, either within sales tax as a whole, which, which is still the city's largest revenue source, and as I mentioned, uh, working uh, and collecting really well, but rather we've had to go down into that next level of analysis and forecasting and understanding in terms of uh, how the, the virus and public health are impacting those areas of the economy. So uh, thank you, Fred. I just wanted to punctuate that just a little bit, uh, but I think these numbers uh, set forth our gap and then how to accomplish filling that gap. So thank you for allowing me a few extra moments there. And, and uh, later today, if folks have comments or questions about uh, page 33 and our, our revenue collections and forecast, why we can, we can address those. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm gonna put this up and let everybody let everybody take that in for a second before I uh, before I start on this. So, the revenue projections that you saw from Fred leave us uh, with an estimated 2020 gap of uh, about 18.7 million dollars. We're gonna use use round numbers as we as we go through these. Um, this shows, and as we as we talked about before, this shows the revenue decrease before the expenditure reductions that have already already taken place, which is why this is different from the cash burn uh, build number that you saw previously. Um, I want to emphasize this and talk about why 2020 is important with the 2021 budget uh, conversation. Um, we really need to have a strong handle on 2020 before we move into 2021. Uh, due to uh, the availability of sources uh, of funding next year, like carryover and our reserves. So getting a firm grasp of 2020, whether we'll need to use reserves um, or, or other funding mechanisms, uh, lets us know our options as we move into 2021. Um, and then lastly on this slide, uh, I wanna introduce this concept of the pie chart and you're going to see this um, this pie chart around uh, closing the gap you're going to see this on a number of slides as we go forward um, and it's going to be a bit smaller on the following slides um, but what we're going to do is um, present this and as we go along and talk about different options um, or different proposals that are in the proposed budget um, you're going to see the blue portion 
um, shrink in each side and there's going to be a portion that's taken up by um, a goldish uh, color that's going to present you the options or the proposals um, that are included in the budget um, to close that gap. Um, I, I would say we're going to do this once for 2020 and we're going to do it another time for 2021. So I'm going to try and keep those um, separate for you because really, um, you know, the, the the funding year starts over for us um, as we go from December 31, December 31st uh, to January 1st. Um, so just a just a little preview of what we're going to see over the next couple of slides. Um, so here's that uh, here's that pie chart we we spoke about um, with the impact of the strategic hiring. Um, and I'm going to talk through this a bit. Uh, this slide shows a little bit more information um, than we've discussed previously as we've given updates on the strategic hiring. Um, that's because um, this is a bit of a deeper dive on the information than what you've seen. Um, we're including savings um, on uh, pension and medical insurance that I don't know that we've necessarily shown broken out um, or shown previously. And we're also showing non-benefited salary savings. Um, so we've had significant non-benefited salary savings, especially in parks, rec, and libraries as we've deferred hiring seasonal staff um, and used existing um, exempt or non-exempt staff to fill those needs. Um, you'll see all the items on this slide total up to um, a projected through the end of the year savings across all our funds of 5.2 million, um, but then just the general fund portion of that is 4.3 million. Larry, if I could uh, invite you up to speak on the short-term pause uh, recruiting item. Thank you, Chris. Uh, carrying forward here uh, in terms of closing the gap and how we're doing that, uh, I just wanted to describe, uh, and we've covered this in a couple of uh, COVID updates with uh, the city council, uh, both our recruiting and uh, positions vacant, positions filled and so forth. And I just wanted to uh, set forth sort of where we are in terms of recruiting. And I probably should have uh, taken this last bullet point and put it into two columns because some um, positions we are actively recruiting. So in the police department, uh, we, you'll see on our website, we're actively recruiting uh, for seven uh, police officer positions. And uh, anyone who's listening, we'd invite your uh, application. So uh, please uh, visit the city's website and uh, uh, please uh, submit an application. That would be terrific. We're also, uh, we've also uh, closed our recruitment and our evaluating applications in the police department for two dispatcher positions. And so those, those in the police department are sort of active recruitments. Um, in our communications division, uh, we have a short-term pause. Uh, on four positions, but they are budgeted uh, for 2020 and for 21. Um, in our technology department, uh, we are uh, actively recruiting uh, for a position uh, that has been closed and uh, we've gone through the evaluation uh, of those uh, applicants and are determining next steps. And similar for our public works and utilities, we have a couple of positions there. So I just wanted to uh, have those on the record and uh, recall uh, what is frozen and uh, what is budgeted and so forth uh, moving forward. And then in, at, at that COVID update, I promised a bit of a survey and some information that we uh, found related to furloughs. And I wanted to describe that on the next slide. And I have to tell you, uh, I was receiving updates and data and information as early as this morning, believe it or not, from uh, a couple of cities. And so, Mr. Lindsay, if you would inv advance the slide, please. Mr. Uh, Dory, just... you've got a question on this slide if you'd like to address oh, that before we move forward. I, thank you. I beg your pardon. Councillor DeMott? I'm, I'm curious on the communication um, pause. There was some question about some uh, communication positions that were posted, and it seemed like the majority of council had asked for those to be frozen. So I'm just curious if those are part of the four. Yes, uh, thank you. Those are part of the four. Uh, they, um, we are not recruiting for those positions. They are in the budget uh, presently, uh, and they're recommended for, they're in the proposed budget for 2021 as well, but not uh, taking any next steps to advertise or uh, receive applications or recruit. Great, thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, also, with that uh, COVID-19 update, I had a question related to furloughs, and I just I, I have to say that I've uh, we were just getting data and information right up till this morning. So this slide is is not in your proposed budget um, today. So I just want to run down what it what it sets forth. Uh, and the information that's here and, and perhaps not here. And we'll continue to update this and monitor it uh, as uh, all of this unfolds related to staffing and so forth and as it relates to furloughs. So first, uh, let me say that I uh, conducted the survey related to full-time staff. Um, you know, our city of Westminster uh, avoided hiring seasonals and accomplished uh, similar savings to those that uh, may have furloughed some of their museum, recreation, uh, parks uh, type staff and a few other communities. So I just wanted to break this into three categories and describe it and we'll continue to evolve it as time goes on. Uh, I will say in terms of understanding what other cities may do in their 21 budgets, all of these other cities, in fact, uh, I happen to know that City of Aurora this morning is also having its budget uh, retreat and discussing all of these various things. But um, first, related to full time, the, the right column I think is pretty evident and uh, obvious. The middle column, however, some staff I just want to describe a little bit, uh, and that is that uh, that involved either some uh, seasonal, temporary, and part-time workers and involved some full-time workers. So for Aurora, Boulder, Broomfield, Denver and Littleton, uh, the, that involved some staff, but uh, generally not any first responders, as I had uh, as I had described uh, in our previous update. And then all staff, I actually I even have to asterisk that, and I put it in the all staff column for Loveland uh, because they uh, have set forth some furloughs for some of their police department. So when I said all staff, that means across all of the departments of the city but not necessarily 100% of the workers. So I just needed to asterisk that. And, and also I think you're aware that the city of Loveland uh, fire does not have its own, uh, a fire department that's controlled uh, by its own city council, but rather it is the uh, Loveland Fire and Rescue, which is a separate district. So um, all of these uh, have many stories in and of themselves. Uh, I would say that uh, there are similarities and differences uh, between each of the cities and counties represented here and uh, we could continue to talk about those and uh, advance them and we'll continue to update as we uh, gain additional information. Mr. Lindsay? Thank you, Mr. Dorr. So we've talked about the savings um, from the strategic hiring um, and how that fits into the gap. Um, there are some additional options as we move forward again on 2020 um, to respond to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, in just a moment, Fred's gonna talk about uh, carryover. Um, Seth Plass is going to talk about um, potential deappropriation of capital projects. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, the potential use um, the potential use of reserves, um, like we've previously talked about um, with council. Again, these are additional steps and really options that could be taken to close the, the 2020 gap. Thank you, Chris. Um, so on an upcoming agenda, we have a carryover action, uh, specifically on September 28th. Now for those of the, uh, the who might be listening in who don't know what carryover is, uh, that's basically unspent money from the prior year that carries over into 2020 that's available for expenditure. Um, it could be generated by if revenues came in higher than we budgeted uh, or if we didn't spend all of our expenditure budget. So that's just kind of a high, high level view of it. Normally we do the carryover process a little earlier in the year than September. But of course, uh, 2020 is different because of COVID. We wanted to talk about how, like what approach we should use with carryover. So um, basically for all non-utility fund carryover, um, or a vast majority of it, 9.4 million, uh, will be proposed to potentially mitigate, um, you know, 2020 revenue shortfalls rather than appropriating it for an expen a new expenditure um, and then there will be a proposal like a proposal to appropriate some operating and capital expenditures 
but it's very small and generally um, you know revolves around restricted funds um, and again I'd like to emphasize as stated on the slide uh, use of the carryover is only one step uh, to mitigate the gap and as illustrated in the pie chart it's not uh, it does not fully address the revenue shortfall and then I think that takes us to our next step for capital and um, Mr. Plass Thank you, Fred. Uh, good morning. Uh, early on in um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, when uh, policy and budget department realized that there was going to be some economic impacts um, to revenues for the city, um, one of the first actions that we took was to compile a list of existing capital projects that had uh, unencumbered funds appropriated in, in the amount of a million dollars or greater. Uh, once that list was compiled, we actually expanded it to include projects that had unencumbered funds of $500,000 or greater. So when I when I talk about unencumbered funds, what I'm what I'm referring to is essentially there is there was funds in the account, but they haven't been encumbered in a, a purchase order or a mechanism to um, from a contractor agreement to actually pay invoices. So there was funds in an account, but they weren't um, identified for a specific contract or legal obligation to pay. Um, that list ended up being about 34 uh, projects. The total dollar amount was around $42 million, and $29 million of that was unrestricted funds. Um, as as we continued to gather more information, as sales tax uh, uh, actuals came in from month to month, um, there was a point about a, a month or so ago that we decided to identify um, eleven million dollars worth of this list that we could um, uh, possibly propose to be deappropriated to essentially close uh, a gap. Um, that is the table that you're seeing right now. The total of those six accounts uh, totals $11 million. For 2020, uh, we are proposing uh, or expecting to um, present a proposal in the future to use $5 million to close um, part of the gap uh, for 2020. Um, that, that proposal would be presented at a separate uh, future city council meeting. Um, we do anticipate also uh, continuing to put these accounts on budget hold uh, for additional contingency through 2021 um, to ensure that if if revenue projections um, change or vary, um, that we have we have some uh, mechanism to. Uh, to utilize some of these funds if necessary to continue to close uh, revenue gaps. Chris? So Seth, I believe we've got a question from Councillor Voles. Yes. Yeah, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Seth, for this good information. Does this, is this somewhere in our packet, this particular graph? Do I, can you direct me to where I can find this graph in our, in our budget book? Where is it in there? Councillor Voles, this one is not in your budget book because this is going to be a future 2020 uh, action. And, and and if I could just expand upon what Seth said, um, the table here is really options um, for how to how to close the gap. Um, again, one more option in which we're we are presenting to City Council, um, and the recommendation from staff that we expect to, uh, to make, and again, dependent upon uh, revenue project, revenue, uh, revenue actuals the rest of the year, uh, other expenditure reductions. Uh, but right now, the action we're intending to make um, is to is to deappropriate five million dollars um, from the new municipal court facility account. All right, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I wasn't following along properly. Thank you, Mr. Demock. You have a question also. Yeah, 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just curious on the, and you may not know the answer to this, but just forward thinking with the taking the money away from the court fund, is there thought into how that changes the future of trying to go after that? Or are we just not there on that yet? And know that's a area where we could take money to close the gap or what's the full thought process around that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's actually, um, it's both. Um, one, we don't, as you can probably uh, tell, we, we really don't have the fund uh, right now to, to fund a, a full court building. Um, we're probably somewhere between um, you know a third to a quarter of the way to fully fund a new municipal court facility. So that that's part of the reason why it's um, included in this list. Um, the other part is those conversations are occurring um, in the city on whether pay as you go is the right mechanism to fund a new municipal court facility. So. To answer your question, it, it is both. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. So with that on um, the deappropriation of um, capital projects, um, that allows us to close out that revenue gap for 2020. Um, we believe that these actions will close the close the revenue gap and allow the city to enter 2021 um, without using the city's uh, formal reserves, um, which is a critical piece to build our strategy as we move into 2021. Before I move forward, I wanted to I wanted to let that sink in um, and and allow any um, allow any questions on that before we start into uh, 2021 here. Can we get these slides sent to us after today or during the day or? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Chris. I don't see any questions. So again, I want to keep us keep us moving and keep us all in the in the right uh, frame of mind. Um, we've moved past 2020 and now we're into 2021. So um, essentially, you know, we start again on on January one um, of a new fiscal year. Um, so first with 2021, we're going to discuss the projected gap again. Um, we're going to build the same sort of information on a projection for an entire year. Um, and that's going to come in, in two pieces, really. Um, it's going to be a projected revenue piece. Um, and it's also going to be a discussion of cost increases we expect to see in 2021. And then we're going to discuss um, all of the options to close uh, the 2021 portion of the gap. Um, so again, we're, we've closed out of 2020. We're going to present you a new a new pie chart um, that that talks about the 2021 gap. So Fred, you want to jump back into the revenue projections? Thank you, Chris. So previously we looked at 2020. Now we're looking ahead at 2021, as Chris mentioned, and then. Um, so this is very similar to the previous charts we showed, but now it brings in 2021 projections and compares that to both 2019 um, actual collections as well as 2020 projected collections at year end. Um, so a similar format is noted in the bottom. It excludes interfund transfers, grants, those non-recurring type revenues. Um, and so you will see that at the bottom line change from 2019, it's about $20 million. Now, there's some detail in that number that you should be aware of uh, why it looks like such a big number, because a little further on, uh, we're going to show a gap that's um, less uh, in the revenue areas uh, because of the way we're reporting it um, and the way we budget certain items the number looks a little bigger. And so, for example, uh, one of the transfers that's not included is a transfer for, uh, that goes into the General Capital Improvement Fund from the Westminster Economic Development Authority. Um, basically, some money comes over into the capital fund. It reimburses the city uh, for past costs that the city paid for. Um, but that is about budgeted at 1.4 million. In 2021 so that impacts 
the number there. It's not so it it would it might be a little less than the 20 million when you factor that in. Uh, similarly, with development fees in the general capital improvement fund, we normally have a conservative approach to budgeting because a lot of times we we really don't know when those development fees are coming in. So we might appropriate them after the fact. So in 2019, we received uh, a $2.9 million development fee, just a, you know, one payment. And, um, but 2021, it's back to the conservative uh, development fee. So the number is probably a little higher in comparison to the gap that you will see in the following slides. Um, and there's a couple of other points I would like to show on this. Um, we show like a big reduction in general capital improvement fund. Now there's a couple of things that are in the 2021 proposed budget that kind of impact that number. Uh, first, historically, open space money received from the counties each year, which is approximately three or two point three million dollars, uh, went into the general capital improvement fund, and then we did capital projects with the money for you know there were eligible uses for that money. Um, and the 2021 budget proposes that those revenues will actually start going into the post fund so we can better align all the open space activities into one fund and make it a little more clear. Um, and one other change that's proposed in the 2021 budget is to um, record all the accommodations taxes into the general fund, uh, whereas right now a big portion of it goes into the general capital improvement fund. So th that doesn't really have any impact on the bottom line totals because they're all, it affects all the funds that are in the list. But just in case you had thought the number looked weird for say the general capital improvement fund, that's that's coming into play as well, how we're proposing to record some of the revenues going forward. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Doerr, I believe he has some some additional comments to add. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for your work. And uh, you know, I think that there's great opportunity for potentially some confusion as to our revenue forecast going forward. And I just want to make it clear that we're not forecasting another stay-at-home order. We're not forecasting an economic dip as we experienced in March, April, and May of 2020. So hence. Uh, even though we expect to be running lower than 2019 economic activities, we still believe that the Hulk of the calendar year of 2021 will be better than in 2020 because of a, a lack of a, we don't foresee another stay at home order. Uh, that's fairly aggressive, uh, but we're also uh, conservative on the other side of the spectrum, whereby uh, we're not forecasting a 100% return to the economic activity that we uh, experienced in 2019. I feel that that strikes the right balance uh, between upside and downside risk for the city uh, and is a prudent revenue forecast. I do want to say, by the same token, our holiday shopping and revenue activities are just uh, so critical and really fundamental to uh, what will become a revised forecast. We will update this forecast quarterly. Uh, I'd almost I'd like to show you the work that uh, Mr. Kellum did in budgeting for this on a month-by-month -month basis because uh, we've had to keep all of those things in mind as uh, we don't have a stay-at-home order in June of 2021, but we did have it, uh, excuse me, in May of 2021, but we did have one in May of 2020. And so we've had to adjust for all of those ins and outs uh, and it's been quite a challenging uh, experience. However, uh, again, I do believe that it should be uh, an expectation for all of us that we will do a revision to this forecast uh, in the first quarter of next year, once we've had an opportunity to understand that fourth quarter. I know I've sound like a broken record, I've said it a few times today, but it's clearly at the very top of my mind and our entire team that's evaluating the revenue forecast, which of course drives the services uh, that we can deliver to our community. So I just wanted to punctuate that and uh, thank you, Mr. Kellum, the entire team from uh, sales tax policy and budget across the board. And I know that that may not have been uh, visible uh, in our operational and uh, revenue uh, review. So I wanted to, to point that out. Thank you. Mr. Dorp, we've got a couple of questions in the queue. So I'm gonna start with Mayor Pro Tim Sykes. 
Uh, thank you guys, and thank you for your work on this. I recognize it's it's pretty impossible to have a, a crystal ball, but it feels like you've done a lot of work trying to, to give us as much certainty as you can. Um, on page 33 of the report we received, <clears throat> it discusses that um, the projection is 98% of 2019 actual collected sales tax. Um, and then recognizing a 30% reduction in use tax. However, that's a smaller percentage. Um, this number it, 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 is the reason this number is large, looks larger is because of that impact of the, of the decline in use tax. Are you following my question? Yes, yeah, so thank I, I, you. When, when I was reading through this, it seems overly optimistic to think we'd only have a 2% decrease in, in sales tax revenue, recognizing I haven't done the modeling. So I'd like to understand your level of confidence um, in that and, and, and kind of question it. Do we feel like this is too rosy of a forecast? Whether optimistic or pessimistic, we need to continue to be transparent and report our actual experience versus what we forecasted. So we will we will absolutely do that, and that should be a, a very a reasonable expectation. Uh, you know, again, uh, we think that uh, we've experienced a couple of months now of uh, this cracking of the valve, or may I say the current economic experience that we're all seeing. Uh, in the community. Uh, and we think that our current environment for economic activity continues forward. Um, again, we, um, I think we have some optimism potentially in our, in our sales tax uh, forecast, but it could be arguably even higher should uh, we uh, ha continue to have, um, uh, you know, uh, impact in terms of testing and deaths and virus and, and uh, the public health crisis. Uh, and also if our uh, return to in-class schooling and other things uh, continue to be successful. And uh, we know that there have been some bumps in the road and there will probably be uh, some more of those, but we've avoided the wholesale closure of schools that was experienced in April, which was obviously a, a disruption to the economy, uh, both in Westminster and across the country. So um, I appreciate the that uh, we should all have a watchful eye, but we feel as though our core sales taxes over the last couple of months, running at about 98% percent is something that we can reasonably expect to the future but given the nature of the seasonality in the fourth quarter we do have concern and we'll continue to monitor and adjust uh, our forecast but uh, given that we've got a couple of months of that experience and uh, it's feeling uh, generally uh, similar throughout the course of September and and again this is why we would have we would have loved to have uh, done this uh, budget two months from now uh, but we're glad that we didn't have to work up this revenue forecast two months ago it probably would have been significantly more pessimistic so uh, tricky as it is we ha we do have I just want to say significant confidence in this uh, I couldn't I wouldn't put a number to it but uh, we think that this is the best uh, forecast for 2021 based on what we know today. And and Mayor Pro Tem, if I could also add, so so that um, where you're looking at in the budget document um, splits up the sales tax from the use tax portion. Um, so on this slide in particular, if if you, and it you know all of these uh, yeah. depend upon where what which year you compare to. Um, if we look at 2019 as a base year, um, we're looking at um, almost 6% down across the entire sales and use tax fund. So that's really the the totality of the impact across the sales and use tax fund. So um, from 20, 2019 to 2020, um, a gap of $6.2 million. Thank you. Mr. Lindsay, if I could add to that, recall that in May, we experienced a 20% drop uh, in that source of revenue uh, wholesale. Uh, and just here for the month of uh, July activity collected in August, we actually saw a cash increase. Now we looked at our core, we did have some anomalies in the, fire, in the filings, but when we look at our core, we think that uh, we've run at about 98% since the uh, cracking of the valve that's uh, sort of occurred here uh, in June and that that will uh, hopefully continue on forward as we see movie theaters begin to open uh, and a better understanding of social distancing and, and adaptation of the business community as well. So, thank you. Ms. Sykes, is that all of your questions at this time? Okay, Ms. Scully. 
Yeah, so um, thank you, Mr. Dora, for this presentation and Mr. Lindsay um, and Mr. Kelman. This is this is a really good presentation, but I, I share the concerns that um, I heard from Council um, Mayor Pro Tem sites on the optimism um, in saying that we we are anticipating that we will not experience another shutdown like we did in March and April and June and May um, from because of COVID. I, I'm just nervous with that optimism. I, I know that the indication is that we're doing well, um, that the that we're opening back up, that things are going in the right direction. But I, I just worry about the the um, not looking ahead and not planning for a possible shutdown again. Um, I guess I, I would rather err on the side of being conservative than be optimistic and um, end up having later to say to our residents, oh, we, we made a mistake and now we're short again and we have to redo this. Um, I, I'd rather be thoughtful, forward thinking that we're anticipating for the worst, planning for the worst, and hoping for the best. And so um, I guess that's my concern as well. And I, I think um, Mayor Pro Tem Sites really said what I wanted to say, but I, I just wanted to really also jump in on that and say that that really kind of concerns me, to be perfectly honest. Councilor Scully, thank you. I really appreciate your feedback to this. And I think that uh, this will be, uh, this will be the, transition from the city manager's uh, proposed budget to council's adopted budget and will be a policy uh, vision and choice for uh, all of uh, all of the council to consider here in the second half or uh, thereabouts of our meeting today but the, the trade-off for that will be other choices uh, in terms of how to balance the budget or fill the gap as we're calling it so it's really trying to we're really trying to strike that right balance i would also add that, that we do have the ability to be quite nimble in responding to potentially another stay-at-home order which we which we hope to avoid but uh, if we might uh, i'd like to just keeping mindful of the time and council's work uh, today on the subject we'd like to We've, we've set forth our, our forecast and hopefully been very transparent about that. And uh, as we get into sort of the policy matters and uh, how to adjust that, if, if it is the pleasure of council to do so, uh, we will do that here toward the end of the presentation or in the next steps of, uh, excuse me, in the next steps of the meeting. So uh, thank you though, I appreciate that. And I, in fact, we'll, we'll be sure and come back to it. Um, see, if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, I see no further questions. May we proceed? Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Dorr, um, and thank you for the questions, Council. Um, so I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, we wanna talk about the revenue gap, but then the cost increases, and those give us really the total gap that we're looking to close for uh, 2021. Um, so there's a number of items, um, and some of these we're gonna deep dive a little bit into here in a moment, um, but, but uh, first up, um, we're seeing a property liability insurance um, increase uh, in 2021, we're pro projecting an increase. Um, first, we're, we're continuing to balance the cost of services between the utility fund and the general fund. Um, in addition, we believe um, just plainly the cost, of, uh, the cost of claims and the number of claims um, we will likely increase in 2021, um, therefore the increase there. Um, Chris, hang on, hang on a second. Council not all of the slides are visible up on the screen with us having cameras on. So in order for everyone to see the screen, would you consider taking your cameras down while we're on this, while the presentation is being done? Because from my part, I can only see, I can't see the bottom parts of the screen. Or, I'm sorry, the presentation. I don't know if the rest of you can or not. Mr. Seymour, you yeah, I can't hear you, Mr. Seymour. You can increase the size of the slide by sliding the bar, the gray bar up to remove the cameras completely if, you, if you'd like. Chris, I just want to make sure that anybody that's watching this can see the entire slide. Yeah, 
and I'd have to ask Matt because I can't I can't see the uh, public view. Matt, can the folks that are in the um, looking at the stream stream see the whole slide? Yeah, yeah, it looks good on the stream. Okay, okay. thank you. All right. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry for the interrupt. Uh, no, thank you for thank you for the logistical check. Um, the next one up, I want to hit on this slide: um, the transfer from our water and wastewater funds um, is booked to the general fund to pay for uh, the services, support services um, that the utility fund pays for. Um, we propose that this transfer is going to um, decrease due to a cost allocation study that was done, um, and also the ongoing balance of expenses between the general and the utility fund. Um, we believe uh, pension costs will increase, and that's going to be based a little bit on the total compensation discussion we're about to um, we're about to jump into. Um, additionally, um, council approved earlier this year a collective bargaining agreement uh, that includes cost increases uh, that will take place in both 2021 and 2022. Um, staff is projecting a lower employee attrition rate uh, next year, and that's. That's the savings um, that we project um, from uh, employees that leave the organization. Uh, and there's a number of reasons around this. This is something we look at every every year as we do our pay projections. Um, but a, a, a couple of things there, um, we believe because of the, uh, the outside economy, there will likely be um, a little bit less turnover. Um, but where it takes place, um, we believe there will likely be um, the uh, there will likely be um, those will those positions will be filled uh, like in areas like the police department and the fire department. Um, additionally, we're accounting for some of the vacancy savings and some other manners as we'll talk about as we move through the slideshow. Um, lastly, here um, staff and you'll see this in the in the capital plan section, but staff is proposing to implement a body worn camera program uh, within our police department. Um, a new FTE uh, on the operations side would be added to support that program. So there's a number of uh, cost increases in on this slide, um, but then also our, our total compensation program as well um, would add into those cost increases. Um, and so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our human resources director, um, Dee Martin, to uh, come on board um, and talk through these with us. Wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. And I don't see that my camera, there it is. I apologize. I'm in the office. It's a little bit darker than I wish. Hopefully you can see me. And thank you so much, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council. We so appreciate your input. Um, and we are here to receive your feedback as we analyze the information uh, regarding pay and benefits from 2020 and forecasting into 2021. I do want to say a huge thank you uh, to the staff of Human Resources that have spent countless hours working with our jurisdictions, counterpart jurisdictions, to receive information on 2020 pay, as well as uh, forecasting for 21, uh, both for pay and benefits. And I also want to say a huge thank you to the, pay, the budget team and our partners within our departments. Chris, I'll just let you know when to move forward and you can move forward at this time. So Westminster has a commitment to provide a balanced total compensation package that attracts and retains highly motivated and effective employees who are invested in meeting the needs of the community. Don't worry, I'm not going to read all of these slides word for word in the future, but this statement is so important that I felt I needed to read it. It has been in existence for our organization for many years, and it is really what I think di differentiates our organization is that we attract and we reta uh, uh, retain top talent. Uh, we provide a total compensation package that focuses on three pillars or primary areas, an exceptional work environment, based on our values, our mission and our vision, market-based pay and market-based comprehensive benefits. Currently, the organization has an authorized FTE in 2020 of 1,061.966. And as you all are aware, we are under a selective hiring. So we're not filling all of those FTE. 
ready to move on, Chris. It's important, uh, you will hear me, I'm mostly going to be talking about today uh, our market-based pay and benefits. I will say, when we speak to our employees in regards to what is most important to them about our total compensation package, it is absolutely our quality work environment, the teamwork, the importance of the work in serving our community and our values. That is what retains employees. But pay and benefits are important. And so we review our pay and benefits um, with our market. And so I'm going to explain a little bit about what we mean by market in order to better understand our recommendations. This slide shows that we are reviewing our pay and our benefits in a regional market. These uh, jurisdictions are who we consider to be sister organizations. We, we review their pay and their benefits and ensure that we're um, in a good market point. Uh, when that organization does not provide a service, we also look at associated districts. You saw that in our collective bargaining uh, and our survey, survey work of fire districts. We also survey Denver water, wastewater, uh, recreation districts, and library districts. We also, uh, as part of a review of how we're doing in compared to the market, both with pay and benefits, we reviewed turnover as well as our recruitment pools. And yes, right now we are on a selective hiring, but obviously some of our positions we're recruiting for, and so we're monitoring what those pools look like. In 2019, our turnover for full-time and part-time employees was 8.5%. Uh, year to date in 2020, our turnover annualized is 4.2%. Our police sworn uh, have a turnover rate, if annualized, in 2020 of 6.6%. I could flood you with a million statistics, and I don't want to do that, but I want to ensure you're receiving the right information because it'll be important as we're building our pay plan that we receive your feedback. So the next slide. Dee, could you answer a question? Absolutely. Mr. DeMott. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just curious if we could potentially have those statistics you just stated about turnover sent to us since it's not on a slide. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next slide, and thank you. Just jump in when you ever have any questions. I appreciate Hold it. On. We have another one, Dean. Ms. Smith. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, uh, could you maybe do like a year to year, um, maybe like a 2018, 2019, 2020 um, on those statistics, just so we can have a baseline as far as like COVID versus a, a regular year, if that makes sense. Absolutely. We'll provide that information to you. Uh, and as I understand, you would like the turnover rates for those various factors from 18, 19 and 20, correct? Yes, please. No problem. Thank you. We'll absolutely get that information to you. So in terms of market-based pay, the next few slides will be discussing pay specifically. And um, I am not going to be addressing our fire commissioned pay plan. There's 126 FTE that are covered within that 21-22 CBA that you approved earlier in the year. So I won't be discussing the employees uh, and their wages in that work group. I will be discussing uh, the regular other four regular pay plans. That is our department head division manager pay plan or administrative officers, our exempt pay plan, our non-exempt general, and our non-exempt police. And I'll be discussing a variety of recommendations that we have uh, based on our 2020 survey information of pay and benefits and our forecasting for 2021. In terms of uh, rate of pay, people will ask specifically, what are you talking about? What is a market point? And basically what our goal is and has been for a number of years is to take uh, the pay, uh, what employees can make, the max uh, actual, in the average of those nine agencies, as well as what's actually being made or the actual wages. And our desire is to be at a solid midpoint of those nine agencies. And when we're not at that point, we do make recommendations for adjustment. You'll see some of those recommendations in upcoming slides. So our employees receive pay increases, all market-based, in three ways. One is through an adjustment to the pay plans across the board, 
based basically on uh, inflation. Uh, you'll remember in 2020 that the organization uh, put in a 2% market adjustment or ATB to our four regular pay plans. That was for a cost of a million four. Uh, in the second way that we make classification or pay adjustments is through classification adjustments. That's a review of the professions. We have 250 classifications in these four regular pay plans. We review 67 based on benchmark information and all classifications are aligned to a benchmark. So it's virtually a review of our entire classification system. We also pull out special surveys uh, to review based on pay equity, compression, and operational needs. So I'll share those recommendations with you in upcoming slides. Uh, and that is a review of 2020 wages. Third is uh, with employees moving through their ranges. Uh, that is either through step grade or through merit. So moving on, I'll get into more specifics. This uh, slide shows you a sneak peek uh, of what we're recommending for 2021. Some of these numbers are slightly different than what's in your narrative on starting on page 33, but the, uh, the budget numbers themselves are, are absolutely accurate. And we'll be happy to provide this slide to you. Based on our forecast of 2021 from our nine sister jurisdictions, as well as others, we believe the market will be very flat. And so we are recommending a 0% inflation-based market adjustment. Uh, that uh, will impact 936 FTE and obviously at a cost of $0. This compares to the 2% given in 2020 at a cost of a million four, but 0% based on the fact that we believe the market will be very flat. Second is a review of our individual professions accounting, engineering, police. As I said, we have 67 uh, benchmark classifications. All other positions are aligned and we want to pay that prevailing rate of pay. Uh, from our analysis in uh, of 2020 sa uh, salaries, we believe that we need to upgrade or make a pay adjustment to eight benchmark uh, classifications and their aligned positions. I'll show those individual adjustments in a future slide. Additionally, uh, we uh, pulled out a handful of classifications. They're not benchmarks, uh, but really took a look at pay equity to ensure that we're paying appropriately from an equity perspective uh, in our alignments, as well as our uh, uh, a ratio, so to speak, of supervis supervisor to uh, uh, employee uh, or compression, and last uh, through the needs or the operations. And those were through requests from our departments. From that analysis, we're recommending upgrades that would impact 10 FTE at a cost of roughly $30,000. Third, and again, we'll show this in much more detail in upcoming slides, um, is our employees as they move through their ranges. Uh, that's either in a step and grade fashion or through merit. Uh, we are recommending, based on our forecasting of wages in 2021, that three out of the four regular pay plans virtually freeze in their wages. Uh, and they, therefore, our employees would not be moving through their progressions. Uh, with, there is one exception to that, and that is in our police officer pay plan. Uh, we believe that it is important, based on our research of what our competitors are doing, that we fund that progression. That would be at a cost of $133,000. So let me get into some specifics. Next. As we said, we believe the market will be very flat in 2021. So we're recommending a 0% across the board increase to our pay ranges, 0%. So this next slide shows our individual classification adjustments that we're recommending. And obviously we'll wanna get your feedback as we're finalizing our 2021 pay plan. From our review of 2020 salaries, uh, we have the recommendation of the following adjustments in order to get these uh, FTEs, those employees and their alignments to a solid position or prevailing rate of pay 
by the beginning of 2021. Uh, those recommendations are first uh, one in our department head division manager pay plan. That's our information systems manager with an alignment of software engineering manager, both in information technology. Uh, two recommendations in our exempt pay plan, uh, one to accountant, which has a number of aligned positions, as you can see there, and three, an upgrade uh, or adjustment to our chief information security officer in IT. None of these employees have an automatic pay adjustment. They're all merit-based. So they will go through, as all of our employees will for our exempts, um, a review process here this fall. And if you authorize this upgrade, they would have the ability to earn up to 3% at the beginning of 2021 uh, based on their merit review. Next. This slide shows employees or benchmarks that we're recommending within our uh, non-exempt general classification pay plan. Uh, first, we believe in order to um, get these employees to a solid market wage, that they would receive a 2.5% adjustment at the beginning of 2021. That is um, automatic as they're in a step and grade system. It would be an adjustment to administrative assistant and those aligned to classifications, code enforcement supervisor, which has uh, many alignments or has some alignments uh, within our civilian police ranks, supervisors, electrician three, which does have some alignment of some of the skilled trades, and GIS specialist. Again, those employees would receive, if you authorize it, a 2.5% adjustment to get them to a prevailing rate of pay at the beginning of 2021. Then based on that third category, which we'll jump to here in a minute, um, they would their pay would then be frozen and they would not move additionally through their uh, pay ranges. Next. This slide shows our police officer, senior police officer benchmark. Uh, we have 158 FTE in this classification. It is by far our largest classification. It does also impact uh, sergeants and others within the police uh, sworn pay plan. Uh, based on our market analysis, we believe this industry is continuing to move, maybe a little slower, but it is continuing to move. We're recommending a 2.5% pay adjustment that would be given at the beginning of the year of 2021 in order to keep them and maintain a solid market position. Uh, just to give you a little bit of information, as I am assuming that you will have some questions in this regard, um, based on 2020 wage review of this uh, pay plan, uh, there is uh, we are currently at six out of the 10 jurisdictions, including Westminster. So six out of 10. There's $4,000 difference between the top of the top paying, which is Lakewood, to the top of the lowest of the 10 which is currently Thornton in 2020, and we are six. We believe the 2.5% will keep us at a similar solid market point. Uh, in 2020, you may or may not recall, but council authorized a 5% market adjustment to this pay plan. Is, D, is that, did, did that bump because we had a lot of discussion around that bump this last time around did that keep you where we thought we'd be so six where you thought that would keep us yes and and you know to be honest with you councillor demott i think we were very glad that we sort of preemptively paid that five percent and that kept us in a much better stance uh, for 2020. So we were happy to do that. And I think uh, the 2.5%, because we're hearing different things from um, our counterparts, that that will keep us at a similar position. Great, thank you very much. You're, you're absolutely welcome. Uh, moving on. This next slide, and there's so much information I could provide you as to the why, it, it represents, um, upgrades to that would impact 10 FTE and probably was 50, 60 hours of analysis um, by employees in the organization. It's uh, time intensive to really ensure pay equity uh, and to ensure that uh, we're being appropriate in regards to our operations. Uh, and so you will see 
some of these adjustments are regarding pay equity. And some, uh, for example, that last one there is a recommendation to reclassify 1.0 police officer, senior police officer to a sergeant to help with the supervision in the PSU unit. Again, that's somewhat reaction to some of the things that are currently happening in the police industry. If council authorizes these uh, upgrades or adjustments, it would cost approximately $30,000. If all of these upgrades which is really, again, an analysis of 2020 salaries to get us to a solid market point at the beginning of 2021. If you authorize these, it would impact 271.916 FTE at a cost of, excuse me, at a cost of approximately uh, $597,000, right? This compares to well over a million cost in 2020. And that was an off budget year when we didn't review all of our benchmarks. Next, in regards to our final slide, wages. We have spent a lot of time analyzing the information, asking uh, communities, what are you planning to do for 2021? Uh, from our current analysis, we believe it appropriate to virtually pay freeze uh, employees in three of the four pay plans, that this is based on market data. Uh, that would impact uh, roughly 700 employees, that would receive a 0% increase or they would not move through their ranges. There is one exception to that, and I think it's a very important exception to acknowledge, and that is what we're seeing from our neighboring jurisdictions is that they will be planning to fund their police officers to move through their progression. Uh, currently, 81% of our officers are at the top of their range. This would afford the 19% to continue to move through their range at an additional cost of $133,000. So all of these recommendations or adjustments to pay are all based on the market, even when they are difficult, uh, they are based on the market. And it compares to um, what we spent in 2020, which was well over $3 million. Okay, any questions on pay specifically? D, we're going to take see if there are any questions that we've had a council member has asked for a break. Uh, I've been waiting for a while. Absolutely. We are going to take lunch in about an hour and 15 minutes. So, council, I'm going to give you a short five minute break right now. We'll come back and catch questions and then uh, we'll hold any other breaks until lunch. So right now you're on a five minute recess. We'll be back at 10 minutes till 11, please.
All right, Council, I want to make sure everyone is returned. Councilor DeMott, you're back. All right, try to make a roll call real quick. Councilor DeMott, you're back. Yes, sir. Director of Tim Sykes. Yes, sir. Councilor Seymour. Gotcha. I see you, Rich. Councilor Scully. Yes, sir. Councilor Smith. Councilor Smith, you're back. All right, I can see her on screen. And Councilor Bold. Yes, sir. All right. Ms. Martin, would you please continue? And I'll start to see if there are any questions on the part that uh, Ms. Martin has presented so far. Absolutely. Uh, let me make one clarification, uh, clarifying statement um, to what I've said regarding our police uh, pay adjustment in 2020. Uh, as we said in our recommendations for 2020, uh, between whether or not we should do the four or the five or four and a half, um, you know, we what we find is that many jurisdictions in this region follow suit and that they are behind our recommendations. So, for example, Lakewood, by their mandate, must increase, and they increase in April, uh, and uh, Broomfield adjusts in July. So we're not exactly sure uh, what would have happened and where we would have fallen, uh, had we given less than the 5%, but I can tell you the 5% put us uh, at six in uh, those 10 jurisdictions. Right. Councilor DeMott. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the last, or a couple slides ago, you had a, a Chief Security Information Officer. Is that a new position or is that a current position? Uh, it is a current position. Uh, what we're seeing, though, and Councillor DeMont, you, I'm sure, absolutely know, uh, knowing that industry, uh, that that is a very hot market. Uh, and so that is, uh, it is a benchmark, and we did review that. Uh, very important that that is the individual that watches our IT security. Okay. Yeah, no, you're you're right. I, I just actually got a new job. So I know the market for IT is still hot, but I just didn't realize that we had one of those in the city. So cool. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, other questions, Council? Ms. Martin, I'm not seeing any other questions, so go ahead, please. Okay, so last, and I'll make this brief, is a, is a review of our benefit recommendations. It's the third pillar of our three tiers um, of total compensation. And again, uh, pay and benefits are very important that we provide market-based pay and benefits with the most important, frankly, being uh, to our employees in terms of retention, a quality work environment. Uh, a couple of the things that you'll see here on this comprehensive benefit package are things that improve that work environment. Uh, absolutely employee uh, training and development, leadership programs, um, our general leave program, those are all things that really enhance the quality of life for our employees. Uh, our comprehensive benefit package is based around meeting the full need uh, as much as possible of our employees and certainly doesn't meet all needs. Every employee is slightly different, but it is meant to be a life cycle uh, comprehensive benefit package. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, all of our non-medical uh, contracts are good through 2021, so I really won't focus on those. Uh, we are able to continue to offer those at the same rate. Uh, for our 2000 uh, 21 Medical Dental, we've worked really hard. And I, I just have to say a huge thank you uh, to our benefit staff led by Lisa Chrisman and our benefit broker. Um, and I know Councillor si or Mayor Pro Tem Sites, you're in the industry, you know, uh, Medical Dental is, is very uh, expensive and it's very important that we stay on top of the trends. So with that, uh, we were able to uh, work with our our benefit brokers and continue to offer three, um, three plans for our employees. 
Two of those are uh, with Aetna. One is a narrow network and one is a broad network plan, and they are uh, self-insured. And the third is an option uh, to be a part of Kaiser Permanente. The city of Westminster did need to make some pl plan design changes in order to uh, have a sustainable budget uh, and also offer a quality product to our employees. Uh, this, this next slide shows you the design changes that we are recommending within our benefits. Uh, we believe uh, that these are still very much based and are appropriate on the market. What this does do, though at the bottom, you'll see that third bullet, we are recommending a 3% increase to the premiums for both the employee and the employer. Uh, in the rates of our medical dental, 3%. So this is anywhere between a $2 a month increase for employees up to $20 per month for employees based on their selection. Uh, we believe that, uh, that our reserves uh, will very solidly pay for that 3% increase to the employer portion as we have very healthy reserves in our medical dental plan. So. Uh, Combined with the pay and benefit, the pay recommendations earlier, a 665 FTE, uh, probably over 700 employees as some are in part-time um, roles, uh, will see a reduction in pay in 2021. Um, that is if they are in our medical dental plans. Any questions on pay and benefits? I don't know if he saw it, but I, I have a question, Andy. Um, and I know that I know that the in the back of our binders they have that I had asked about Medigap, um, and so I, I assume we may cover that later on. But what I'm curious about is specific to things like that when we're looking at overall pay, and um, specifically in those um, types of jobs such as fire and police, where other agencies start doing things like Medigap for. Um, for their employees that that do those sort of jobs H how do we try to um cover for that in the market because i know we look at the market and you know that <clears throat> ultimately if thornton starts doing that at some part point that starts pulling from our employee base and then i assume that you start potentially seeing other agencies do the same kind of thing especially with uh, policing being what it is today and being even harder i am assuming to uh, attract people to that that job market so how do we look at those things and and be forward thinking to you know stay at market i guess absolutely um thank you for that question i believe we'll be diving into that even more deeply um counselor as you uh, absolutely uh, suggested at the end of this presentation but i will tell you uh, that is part of our benefit survey and analysis um all of those factors uh including potentially what is being offered uh, post uh, uh, post employment, um, but we will absolutely cover that question in uh, very quickly in future slides. Great, thank you. Absolutely. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask how dramatic of a difference is it in the benefit packages that are provided? Um, so, like the amount of increase of deductible, at maximum out of pocket, copays, um, all of the items listed here. Is it is it just a step up, or is it a dramatic? change that we're asking them people to pay more for? Uh, you know, I, I believe it probably is somewhat dramatic, but it is still a very quality uh, product. But for example, for a couple of our plans, the out-of-pocket uh, max will move for a family from in-network uh, from 8,000 to 10,000 out-of-pocket max. So there, they are increases. Um, uh, for example, uh, out of uh, network uh, would move from uh, 24,000 to 30,000, but that would be out of network. That's a pretty rare thing to hit your maximum out of pocket. I'm curious about like the deductibles and co-pays that are a little bit more your how you're typically utilizing your plan. Absolutely, and we can certainly share this detail with you. But basically, uh, just to give you an overview, uh, what the changes would be for in network uh, would move from uh, let me see here, 350 to 400 for a single or 700 to 800 for family. So it is fairly moderate. Uh, and then out of network would move from 700 to 800 for a single uh, to 1400 to 1600 for family. 
Yeah, those are still incredibly um, generous, attractive benefits. So I would Absolutely. I would not categorize them as as um, dramatic in any same. So I feel very comfortable that we've been able to have cost containment with that level of an attractive benefit package. Absolutely, and and it's all very much uh, market based and comparing to our neighboring jurisdictions. We're very proud of the work that was done in this area. Are there other questions, Council? Ms. Martin, I have no other questions for you at this time. Thank you. All right, Mr. Doerr or Mr. Lindsay, I think we're back to you guys. Who's who's up next? Council, thank you for your, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, thank you for your patience. Uh, we're ready to transition into uh, closing of our 2021 budget gap. And uh, I'll give Mr. Lindsay just another moment or, or, or two to come aboard. And as he's, uh, looks like he's advancing our slides, but probably getting his uh, microphone and uh, cameras organized, you'll, what you'll see is a holistic approach. Uh, we believe that was the course of action for us to bridge this gap. And you'll see across these uh, seven points, uh, the way that uh, we're proposing that to be done. And um, we do want to provide some information here, uh, but most of these things will be in your binder and I'll be uh, really mindful of, I, I think we want to conclude our uh, presentation slides. We've still got a, a fair amount uh, left, but we'll probably be picking up the pace so that we can uh, break for lunch and then have the after lunch discussion be uh, those policy choices and uh, follow up questions from city council. Mr. Lindsay? Thank you, Mr. Doerr. I was having a brief moment of user error technical issue there, so um, we can uh, happy to happy to continue on. Um, so we just talked a bit about um, both uh, revenue a little bit ago, increased costs, including our total compensation package, um, and so that that gets us then to um, our gap concept for 2021. Um, we we are uh, talking about 15 million dollars approximately um, in lower revenues in 2021 and approximately three million dollars um, in increased cost in 2021 to give us a gap um, of 18 million dollars i'm going to reset this gap concept again so we wrapped up 2020 already we're about to start into uh, 2021 closing that gap so uh, in a few slides, you're going to see the little the little pie chart reappear, um, and that's going to be on 2021 um, as we move forward. So let's talk about the the ways, and a lot of this again is outlined in your uh, in your budget document. But let's talk about the uh, the ways and the manners to close that that 18 million dollar uh, gap. Um, We've listed in the budget uh, message um, and throughout the budget document, um, this grouping um, of items, and we're gonna describe each one as we move along through the 2021 uh, budget. And again, there's our, there's our pie chart that we're gonna keep an eye on as we, as we move forward. Um, so first up being administrative reductions, um, and I think we've talked a bit about this in previous updates, but um, we are proposing to uh, reduce uh, mainly travel for training uh, and also uh, any food related to that um, through our budget for 2021, uh, two purposes. Uh, one, we believe travel for training will likely be limited in 2021 anyways, um, but also that's another way to decrease services that won't necessarily um, be public facing um, in the short term. Um, we also uh, took a look at some citywide consulting budgets. Um, and then there's also a slew of uh, reductions within departments um, to begin to allow us to close that gap. And I'm gonna ask uh, John Prasner if he would uh, join us. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, so we, in continuation of the approach we have taken in 2020 and our strategic hiring plan, um, we evaluated some of the positions that are currently vacant, and we are projecting to keep those positions vacant um, through 2021. And that includes 35 regular benefited positions um, of totaling 1.6 million in salaries, along with seven temporary benefited positions um, of 300,000 for a total of 1.9 million um, in salaries. Additionally, we have, um, we're seeing a lot of turnover in the parks and rec and libraries department. So we, we do anticipate future vacancies in that department moving forward. And we're projecting an additional $350,000 in savings for those positions um, that we don't have identified at this moment. Uh, and to give a little bit more detail on the next slide, um, has the list of the positions. Um, I wanted to take a couple of note. Um, there are three police officer trainee positions. Um, those are positions that are, um, when we have retirements coming up, we hire three, we up to three additional um, police officers to put in the academy. Um, this will not reduce our, our overall FTE count in the department, but just those um, kind of temporary additional ones as well. Uh, we also have three street maintenance workers, um, and then in the libraries um, division, um, those librarians, associates, clerks, um, those are six positions. Um, we have five life cards and four guest relations clerks. So those are the, the 42 positions that are not anticipated to be filled in 2021. And if there's no questions here, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, John. Um, keep us uh, keep us moving along here. So one of the other methods uh, we're proposing to use to help us close that 2021 gap um, is analysis and then use of our uh, some informal reserves within uh, the city's fund structure um, in a one time uh, one time capacity, one time savings from some revenues. Um, so. The city has a, a, a number of accounts and funds where we pay for items like uh, self-insurance, um, but also vehicles, um, vehicles, copiers, um, wildland fire equipment, um, PC replacements, um, and staff has done an excellent job going through each of those. And in, in a couple of cases, uh, we actually brought in uh, actuaries to do a report to give us a, a much clearer analysis of exactly how much uh, we need to have in a reserve or a fund balance in each of these funds. Um, and uh, we are proposing to utilize uh, approximately $1.2 million of what are informal reserves in a one-time manner to help us close that gap. Um, so that comes out of a, a number of uh, a number of places that are identified in your budget book, but a couple of, uh, of heavy hitters uh, using fund balance out of our medical dental fund, uh, using fund balance out of our workers' compensation fund, uh, both of those well within limits um, from actuarial studies, um, and then also using some reserve funds we have avail available in the general capital outlay replacement fund, or GCORF, which is where we pay for vehicles, copiers, PC replacements, uh, we did a we did a uh, very deep dive into each of those accounts, um, how long the replacement cycles are, the cost of assets within those, um, and we think we are uh, in a very comfortable position to uh, use uh, one point two million dollars of of informal reserves. Right. Turn it back over to Seth Plass to talk about uh, capital reductions to help us continue to close the gap. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'll, I'll take a quick moment to remind City Council to refer to your uh, binder as there is uh, more detailed information located there on what we'll be discussing. Uh, another, another mechanism that we are using to help close the gap is in the form of capital reductions or uh, reduced capital improvement project uh, requests. Uh, in, in doing so, we came up with four objectives. Uh, the first being eliminate the sales and use tax transferred to the general capital improvement fund. Uh, this has been a, a typical practice in past 
budgets. Um, just to give you a, a frame of reference, last year we transferred $4.8 million from the sales and use tax fund to help fund the CIP program or the GCIF um, fund. Uh, we are proposing to not transfer any of the sales and use tax funds this year. Uh, the next objective is to remove the accommodations tax earmark uh, to specific CIPs. In the past, they've been um, allocated to the Community Enhancement Program uh, CIP request. Uh, however, the accommodations task, tax, tax is uh, unrestricted and uh, we felt that proposing it to be used uh, for uh, GCIF is, is um, in general would be more appropriate for the 2021 budget. Additionally, for uh, CIP requests from, from departments, we placed a, a high emphasis on essentially taking care of what we own in the form of asset management and maintenance uh, CIP requests. Uh, we do have some proposed uh, improvement style C CIPs that are proposed in the 2021 budget. Um, those were selected based on the high return on investment potential. And what I mean by that is the, the typically those are your, your grant funded projects to where um, the city's local match is roughly 20% uh, or 10% of the total grant funding. And, and that's the reason why those were uh, selected. Um, if, if requests did not meet um, these objectives, that is most likely the reason why they're, they're part of the unfunded list that we provided in the proposed budget. Um, I want to also take a quick opportunity to um, let you know of a couple um, best practice changes from past budget. These are actually objectives that we had prior to COVID-19 and the financial situation we were in. And um, luckily we were able to accomplish some of these goals that we set in um, very early in the year. Um, one of those being transitioning, um, there were a few uh, FTE or full-time equivalents that were being paid out of CIP accounts. We have that now transitioned those to operating budgets, which is a, a better practice to use. And also we, we put more emphasis on uh, ongoing CIP requests versus major CIP requests. So ongoing uh, CIPs are your more long-term maintenance style capital projects that span from year to year. A great example of this would be our ro arterial roadway account that uh, maintains our asphalt roadways. Um, a major CIP has a defined start and end date, and after the project has closed out, no additional funding is needed. Next slide. Uh, this, this table in chart is uh, the proposed uh, CIP uh, categorized by fund. Um, as you can see, the, the utility fund still uh, uh, is a majority of the total CIP program. Um, as you're aware, the, the funding, um, the revenue sources are less dependent on economic conditions. Um, and therefore, as you'll see in a, a few slides, um, there, there really isn't much change from uh, typical as far as the utility fund goes. Um, I also wanted to identify the uh, focus on the General Capital Improvement Fund, or GCIF. That uh, proposal is uh, significantly reduced from previous budgets per the, um, the objectives that we, we discussed earlier. Um, in fact, in, in 2020, the, the GCIF was uh, $18.2 million, so we're seeing um, close to a 60% reduction from previous years. Next slide. Uh, this table is the CIP, proposed CIP um, by department. I wanna make uh, a couple clarifying um, statements.
statements on this table. So this is for general capital improvement fund only. Uh, we did this because uh, the GCIF spans all all departments, gives a good um, indication as the types of reductions that were taking place um, uh, compared to um, the initial requests that were done um, earlier in the budget process when we were still fine tuning the actual budget projection or revenue revenue projection numbers for 2021. The uh, as I as I just mentioned the requested column was the original request by departments. Again, that was prior to um, receiving additional sales tax um, actual information month to month as we've gone through the COVID-19 financial situation. And uh, prior to um, fine tuning our 2021 revenue projections and budget projections um, to, to then uh, incorporate those objectives, which led to um, an ask for the departments to reduce their requests to what you're seeing in the third column, which is the proposed section. Th this proposed section is what you see in your um, binder packet. I wanted to focus on um, two uh, departments specifically, first being um, general services. As, as you might be aware, uh, general services uh, does a, a wide range of services for the city, um, including facilities maintenance. As you can see, uh, no new funds are being proposed for 2021. And I wanted to um, clarify that um, that does not mean that no work or no maintenance is being done in 2021. There are existing uh, funds in accounts um, and in that can be used for maintenance activities in 2021. Um, in talking with the department and subject matter experts for these projects, um, it was a consensus that they could perform, general service could perform necessary maintenance using those funds um, and or uh, defer certain maintenance activities uh, to 2021 without significant impacts to our facilities. The other department that I want to highlight is the parks, recreation, and libraries. So as you can see, the request versus proposed uh, did not change. The reason being is um, there are certain revenue sources within GCIF that are very specific to parks, recs, and libraries. Those being um, public land dedication and um, park development fee. Um, those revenues were were set um, relatively early in the budget process and the projects that um, can be completed with those restricted funds within parks, recreation, and library um, really did not change. If you were to look at the uh, parks, open space, and trails fund or post um, or the uh, golf fund, you'll notice that uh, parks, recreation, and libraries had um, significant reductions from their requests versus their proposed similar to the rest of the departments. Just to give you a, a quick um, number to that, their parks, recreations, and libraries original requests totaled 15.2 million and they were reduced to uh, approximately $8 million in total or a 47% reduction. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Staff, stay on that one for a minute, will you? Sure. I understand what you said in general services, uh, those projects. However, based on all of our experience, when you do a lot of deferred maintenance, the likelihood of that maintenance not costing us a lot more in the long term is a bigger problem. Uh, I will tell you, I have some serious concerns about cutting general services to nothing on maintenance. Uh, even though you may have maintenance funds in other department areas or other accounts, that's very concerning that we're not, because the perception is, regardless of what you just said, perception is you're doing no maintenance. And I understand what you said, that there is maintenance there, but that's a pretty big cut from almost 3 million to nothing. I'm a little bit concerned of what is the issue that was proposed in finance that also has zero dollars. 
So those two, to me, are, are very concerning in what we're presenting, that uh, I think the potential of financial impact to us further on for not doing maintenance is a bigger cost to us long term. Before you go too much further, I want to go back, Chris, I just, the first slide you were on that talked about uh, training and travel before we get too far away from it. Yes, sir. All right, so if you could put that slide back up. Right there, it's fine. One of the questions I have is we have a lot of physicians within the city that main, maintain their licensure for benefit of the city. That could be police departments, that's the city attorney's office, or engineering department, all have licensing requirements for continued education during the year in order to give to them for their license renewal. An example could be our inspectors in community development that hold electrical or inspector license. They have continuing education requirements that require them to do a certain number of CEUs every year to get to the max on their license renewal dates. Are those training opportunities being removed because then we put ourselves at jeopardy of not having licensed qualified people on staff. Those training opportunities are not being removed. So the plan is to continue, um, especially continuing education and licensure um, and other requirements. Um, we definitely understand the importance of those. Um, the reduction here is mainly around the training that's associated with uh, travel, but those budgets that are that are uh, for licensure, we definitely want to continue those. Yeah, I think we have a fiduciary responsibility. We have to. I don't think it's an option. And then back to Seth's uh, plan, I, I just, I'm very concerned about the fact that we are showing nothing in general services. But I'll, I'll wait till we get further on. Go ahead, Seth. Sure. Um, and, and to answer uh, one of your questions on uh, finance, so the, the $750,000 proposed was for a new uh, sales tax software system. Um, the, the finance department is, is currently using out-of-date out of um, technology, and that was proposed to uh, update the technology for sales tax. Um, Why not? Sales tax that is that going to have a potential impact on sales tax collections? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Can you repeat the question? If we don't do the upgrade to a current software program, does that have the potential of affecting our ability to properly collect sales tax? Seth, can I can I jump in here? Absolutely. So it's it's not an upgrade to an existing system. It's the replacement of an existing system. Uh, we believe. And um, as as far as your question regarding uh, general services, um, we could uh, gather some information uh, from general services, including um, the the maintenance plan uh, from existing funds. Um, and and into 2021 on how maintenance activities can continue to be performed through 2021 and and supply that information if that if that would um, help to answer your question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it would at least make me feel a lot easier. Okay, we'll work to gather that information. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. This table uh, provides uh, some information on the utility fund CIP requests uh, versus what was um, proposed in the 2021 um, uh, CIP. The as you can as you can see uh, again the um, the revenues for the ut utility fund are not as dependent on economic conditions as a uh, general capital um, improvement fund. Or or post, uh, so there there was not um, as much reduction performed as as the general fund um, CIPs. Um, 
just a clarifying note on the storm drainage uh, system. So the reduction um, from the requested to the proposed was actually uh, in line with uh, one of our objectives in taking care of what we own as, as uh, a few CIPs within the storm drainage fund were reallocated um, to fund uh, an ass assessment inventory and or um, assessment and uh, condition inventory uh, project for storm drainage system. So that fund was able to utilize existing funds to help fund a, a new project. That's why you see the reduction from the request to proposed. Seth, I have a, on that particular point, because of the fact that we have the membership in the urban drainage and flood control district, is there any opportunity to assess application into that group to offset some of the um, reduction in the storm drainage area as that might be considered also as under flood control? Uh, there are definitely CIPs within the, the 2021 uh, storm drainage fund that um, have urban drainage or mile high flood districts uh, matching funds. Okay. Um, you answered it. Thanks. Okay. Councilor Sykes. All right. I have double screen, so um, it takes me a while to unmute. Um, I have a quick question in regards to this. Um, obviously, we just had a, a fairly significant um, a rate increase for our, our residents that we voted on in 2018. Um, took place in, in 19 and 20. Um, in order to ensure that we were doing the capital investments that we needed in both our water system and our wastewater system. Um, I'm a little surprised that these numbers aren't higher actually based off of that. And, and I also wanted to ask where is the potential like land acquisition cost? Some of those large ticket items, um, just wanted to see where they're at. I think that there is a little bit of concern in the community to see, um, large capital reserves in our utility fund versus actual um, shovel in the ground projects <clears throat> well i i can answer the uh, really quick on an example with that and then chris could provide some additional information if that works um, so for the water system they are proposing an eight million dollar capital project that will be highlighting um, in a new in a couple slides from now the North Ridge water storage tank replace replacement uh, so that's a significant capital investment in um, a majority of the water system uh, uh, request or proposal for this uh, 2021 budget so th thank you uh, mayor pro tem sites I think that's a that's a really important question Seth Seth highlighted um, one of the one of the bigger projects um, that's going on planned for uh, new project with new funds that's planned for next year. Uh, I think the clarifying point I would like to make is there's um, a lot of existing appropriation um, within both the water and wastewater funds to contribute to uh, continue. Excuse me, um, fairly major uh, projects, um, including um, including the the um, I, I believe we already appropriated the first phase of the uh, water 2025 um, project. So, so they have a lot, um, a lot on their plates. And I think with uh, appropriations that were already made that continue to carry forward as those projects are multi-year projects, um, I think it's a it's a fairly substantial um, capital investment that will take place. Um, we can definitely get back. I don't have the number off the off the top of my head or right here in my in my notes um, for what the existing capital appropriation is um, in either the water or the wastewater funds, but we can we can come back to you with that. Does that help answer your question? It it does. Um, so perhaps I'm incorrect in this too these these numbers um did not seem dramatically they seemed higher but not dramatically higher than the amount we had invested in our cip um prior to um 2019 um and so i just wanted to understand the difference but it it sounds like this is only representative of the additional monies that were 
um, allocating towards the CIP in, in 2021 and does not um, take into account all of that money already appropriated for large item that those revenue increases have helped fund. Correct. There, I there's think it's gonna be, yeah, it's going to be important. You know, we're asking people and it's really painful for a lot of people to pay more on a monthly basis. So I really think it's going to be important that we all understand um, where those dollars are specifically going and, and that we're investing in ourselves um, and have that easy, easily understood by council, um, myself included, and, and also um, our residents. So thanks. Thank you. Um, if there's no additional questions, um, we can move on to the next slide. I just wanted to um, conclude with uh, a couple highlighted projects. Um, the asset inventory and condition assessment is is in keeping with the um, high priority on maintenance and um, and and asset management uh cips this is through the the storm drainage fund um this project is intended to fund a study delivering a complete itemization and condition assessment of all city stormwater assets including all storm pipes inlets manholes outlets and detention ponds this project would develop a risk maintenance repair and replacement schedule the project will also inventory and asset assess data centralization tracking and organization. The body-worn uh, camera CIP request implements body-worn cameras at the police department. State legislation was passed on June 19th, 2020, requiring all local law enforcement agencies in Colorado to provide body-worn cameras for each peace officer of law enforcement agency who interacts with members of the public for purpose of enforcing the law or investigating possible violations of the law. The Towntown Westminster Sheridan Underpass. Uh, this project provides funding towards the design and of an underpass to be constructed at Sheridan Boulevard adjacent to downtown Westminster. This underpass will serve multimodal transportation needs and is intended to increase safety and mobility from the Regional Transportation District RTD Sheridan Station to downtown Westminster. Uh, this project received uh, approximately $6.6 .6 million in uh, grant funding or state contribution. The North Ridge water storage tank replacement. For this project, there are three existing potable wa water storage tanks at the North Ridge site, which is the site um, just south of City Hall. Those tanks, uh, one was recently built in 2017. The other two are both steel, installed in 1980s and at the end of their useful lives. This project will begin with a design for North Ridge tanks one and two, a demolition plan, a plan to provide adequate water storage for pressure zone one and possible land acquisition if needed. The replacement of the North Ridge potable water storage tanks due to the aging condition has been planned for 2021 execution. Staff plans to design both tanks, construct one tank in 2021 and 2022, and then construct the final tank in 2022. Open space land acquisition. The ongoing project fund will be utilized for acquisition of additional open space lands in Westminster. Funding for open space land acquisitions may come from multiple sources, such as the city voter approved post taxes, open space taxes from Adams and Jefferson counties, and public land dedication development fees. The city prioritizes potential acquisitions for those parcels and would facilitate the construction of missing links within the open space trail systems and acquisition that protect the city open space system. And finally, the storage area network or SAN replacement. This project replaces the SAN hardware in City Hall data center with new up-to-date equipment providing faster speeds that are required in today's modern applications. The SAN replacement is scheduled to happen every four years and the current SAN was purchased back in 2017. The SAN replacement includes a comprehensive study to help inform the proper technology to best meet the city's needs um, for the next four years. As part of this project, older SAN hardware will, will, will be moved to a disaster recovery facility to increase data capacity and backup needs. Thank you. 
Seth, before you move off of this and just uh, as a comment on the downtown Westminster Sheridan underpass, uh, you already indicated we have a large amount of this, over $6 million of this has grant funding tied to it. But for the uh, general public, not only does it have that grant funding tied to it, but it has a mandate within those grants that we have to spend this money and construct the project within a specified period of time, or we are subject to losing those. So it's very important that this thing stay on track. We have contributions coming in not only from CDOT, but also Adams and Jefferson County and Dr. Cog to make up this total cost of this project. Excellent point, Mr. Mayor. And Any other um, for council on this one? I have comments, but I'll I'll wait till the policy portion of the discussion. All right, Mr. Demont, you had a question. Um, much like Mayor Pro Tem cites, I'm it, it's probably going to get into the policy, but I just want um so that we have the right people in the discussion. I I do have uh more qualifying questions around the storage area network and if whether or not that's the right time to replace that and how far we can push that out. So, um, but I was planning on bringing it up later on, but just to kind of give a heads up. Okay. Seth, do you have anything else on this? I do not. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, Mr. Doerr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you to Mayor Patem Seitz and uh, Councilor DeMont for your uh, deferral on policy dis, uh, points and discussion. We want to allow as much time for that as possible and uh, getting a little um, narrow on our time. I'm going to just uh, very quickly go through some items. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, if you'd advance the slide, you know, we, we described a, a holistic approach. Uh, to filling this, this budget gap with a loss of revenues and increasing costs. And one of them involves lines of business changes. And we've engaged all of our departments. They've set forth uh, changes uh, in this proposed budget that will help uh, bridge the gap. And it's uh, it's been significant. It's in the multi-millions of dollars. And uh, I will say, I, I'll go through this fairly quickly. And I do expect some policy discussion and potentially some detailed questions, but I would just refer you to page 37 uh, in your binder through page 43. Uh, I'm, my presentation here isn't in that specific order, so I apologize for that. You may have to move around just a touch, but uh, you'll be able to uh, have a few notes. And each one of these is described there, and I'll have some additional detail. But let's keep this uh, moving ahead, given our time constraints and uh, the hope to conclude our presentation at noon here before our lunch hour. So uh, our human resources department uh, has proposed scaling back on a number of events, uh, including our year-end motivational speaker for a savings. Uh, in policy and budget, we anticipate having a request for proposals process that could this fall uh, that will very well uh, adapt our scope of services and perhaps bring into uh, play some competitive bidding. And we intend to uh, achieve a reduction in expenditures uh, for our state lobbyist contracts. Uh, in our police department, we have a bit of a description here regarding uh, our motorcycles for traffic enforcement. And I do want to uh, describe that this would be a multi-year change uh, in phasing the number of uh, motorcycle units uh, from 10 to 5. Uh, we are evaluating the potential impacts to that. And uh, as you've seen, uh, there's a description in the binder. But uh, also, I want to just add that uh, we don't anticipate this impacting uh, the traffic enforcement itself or uh, the issuance of summons and so on, but rather just the way that uh, we would be going about uh, traffic enforcement and traffic management. Also uh, proposed is a change in our uh, canine units uh, from five to four, and uh, our police department believes that uh, the four teams will meet the needs of the city uh, going forward and is an opportunity uh, for a reduction. And then last on this slide, and uh, again, I'm, I'm going rather uh, briskly here because we have a number of these uh, described and a number of details available. The city conducts an annual large item cleanup program. Um, in 2009, uh, the city council uh, determined that it uh, uh, did not uh, meet the needs of the community given its uh, budget crisis at the time, and that was uh, that was terminated and, and uh, uh, curtailed until it returned in 2016. Uh, and then obviously given the financial challenges that we're currently facing, it's been proposed uh, for not funding the, this particular program. And uh, we can get into uh, some of the off, uh, 
alternatives that residents may have to achieve uh, large item uh, pickup and cleanup should those uh, be of interest or become necessary. Um, on the next slide here, I've got a, a, a real extensive, uh, I think, description from our parks, recreation, and libraries department. And I want to tell you that this, uh, this department is committed to providing opportunities for nature, wellness, and literacy across our community. At the same time, this is, uh, this is a line of business or, or a set of offerings that's in a bit of a transition given COVID-19 and how uh, people are engaging with their open spaces and how they are uh, seeking out wellness activities and uh, how they are achieving literacy. Uh, and let me just talk about, about a few of these. Um, you know, in-person hours uh, at our libraries uh, are really just uh, one component of the overall service delivery. Uh, there's clearly a growing uh, importance on libraries without walls and bringing digital services. Uh, in fact, our digital services have increased 37%, and uh, most recently, uh, Council U approved some uh, supplemental funding in that area so that uh, we can continue to meet the demand for uh, electronic book uh, checkouts. And um, additionally, our digital mobile library will bring those uh, uh, online services uh, available uh, to the community as we as we transition, and I I also want to say that this is substantially all of these changes are really uh, connected to our dedication to tracking patron demands and attendance. Our staff is uh, very much data driven in Parks, Recs, and Library, and understands uh, again patron demand and attendance, and uh, believes that this is uh, really just the way that uh, the department uh, and the community are evolving uh, in this area. Um, related to that, uh, the second bullet, it's anticipated that our Parks, Recs, and Library uh, Department will achieve secondary uh, vacancy savings throughout the course of next year of an additional $350,000. They have uh, some indications uh, from their teams uh, that they will uh, have some ongoing vacancies, and it's their intent to map skills and realign service offerings within their existing staff and achieve a, a secondary uh, FTE savings of $350,000. Um, recreation center and pool operations. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of information and, and detail re related to this, and it's a mixture of things. We do anticipate a lower usage uh, than normal. Uh, we do anticipate that uh, the hours of reduction uh, will be spread across uh, multiple different facilities uh, in such a way that will maximize uh, the uh, opportunity for those who participate at uh, those rec centers and in pool operations. And uh, I do have significant details uh, in terms of the locations, the number of hours, but these will be uh, spread across again, a number of different offerings um, in the course of the coming budget year. Park operations. Uh, we know that uh, uh, people are experiencing parks and open space in a way that they never have before, uh, but we believe that pavilion rentals, uh, given uh, our paradigm with uh, COVID-19 is changing the way people access those. And uh, we believe that um, uh, we, we think the right approach is to reduce uh, the rental availabilities, which will have a significant reduction in uh, not only staffing costs, but utilities and, and other operational savings that in our parks uh, division can reduce uh, spending by $200,000. At our mature adult center, uh, everybody knows that uh, the MAC is um, closed at the moment for its traditional uh, operations and it has been providing uh, alternative service, frankly, to the community in terms of uh, food insecurity. And uh, that's been a meaningful endeavor. And in particular, this is a vulnerable um, part of our population that would be uh, attending this center. And we anticipate that it will be closed through the first quarter of 2021, leading to operational savings. Uh, related to golf, uh, we do we are experiencing a significant uh, improvement in our golf activities, and uh, we're continuing to move our golf activities to a level of full enterprise. And what that means is that uh, the golf uh, enterprise will be able to take on pension costs that have uh, previously been allocated uh, to uh, the general fund. And this is. Uh, uh, you'll see a theme that uh, we've done in terms of our analysis of informal reserves, but also uh, the charges uh, from one fund to another uh, to make sure that those uh, are in the right place and uh, help us bridge this gap. 
recreation programs. Uh, we've all seen the, the photographs of, of folks working outdoors, uh, working out outdoors and uh, uh, approaching recreation programs in a way that we've never seen before. And uh, we believe that uh, with strategic changes in 2021 due to limitations, frankly, caused in terms of uh, how folks can attend and uh, the cleaning of things offset by a change in revenue, we are targeting a, a recreation program expenditure savings of $55,000. And then uh, related to our Stanley Lake operations, of course, we know that there are significant uh, desires and interests to access uh, Stanley Lake. Uh, but at the same time, we do have a vacancy uh, in our operations there. Uh, and we believe that uh, we, will, we will still have curtailed access uh, at Stanley Lake for some period of time during 2021 and have targeted uh, $40,000 uh, operational savings there. And then lastly, uh, Parks, Recs, and Library hosts uh, several annual events. Uh, some of them are large uh, scale in nature, uh, and it is uh, the pursuit of the department to partner uh, and sponsor with others uh, in order to facilitate smaller events that will uh, minimize interactions uh, related to COVID-19, but uh, still engage our participants in uh, activities uh, and events that will engage the community. But we believe that that can be done uh, with, uh, because of the slightly smaller attendance, potentially uh, approximately a $17,000 uh, savings uh, in this particular area. This is, I, I just have to really compliment our Parks, Recs and Library uh, Department and all others uh, for stepping forward and offering these lines of business changes. We know that there'll be much discussion and potential uh, interest in greater level of detail. We can, we'll certainly be available to do that, not just today, but it's probably one of our uh, follow-up items uh, for future sessions. But uh, with that, I'll just close with the last uh, group of these um, on our next slide. And you'll see how uh, that uh, translates to uh, sort of bridging the gap uh, that we're seeking to do here. Uh, but in our community development uh, department, we've, again, as I mentioned, the informal uh, uh, reserves analysis, we are uh, allocating a senior engineer uh, and some of our city engineers work and time and expense uh, for their work designing and managing stormwater infrastructure from our general fund uh, to our stormwater fund uh, in order to appropriately align those costs. Also in community development, uh, our off-hour inspections, let me describe that just a little bit. Uh, it is also in the binder, but um, our, our uh, group of inspectors are on the job Monday through Thursday uh, in our uh, typical schedule, but we know that the construction trades and business uh, do command uh, some Friday inspections due to the workflow of those particular projects, and we want to keep those moving forward. We believe that uh, we can meet current demand uh, for those uh, services because, as I mentioned earlier, building construction use tax uh, being diminished, that we are seeing some uh, tail off in some of these activities. Uh, we believe that we can continue to meet current demand while uh, decreasing the appropriation, $17,500 for 2021. Uh, in our fire department, uh, you know, we have this uh, item uh, that uh, we can reduce uh, related to public outreach. Lot Largely, uh, this is due to limited pub public interactions. Um, our Citizen Fire Academy uh, will not be uh, planned for 2021, but we'll attempt other uh, outreach programs that'll be in a much more scaled down uh, approach. And, and largely that's due to exposure that we would like to see limited to our fire service and, and that uh, uh, will create a bit of a savings there. And then finally, uh, for this slide, uh, community recycling centers. And uh, that's been described a little bit in the binder, but I just wanna set forth that uh, the city's community recycling centers are unmonitored. That is, people can drop off uh, items uh, at those locations. And um, unfortunately, we're experiencing a, a case where our skilled labor and trades people are uh, cleaning up and uh, organizing uh, those particular facilities. Uh, and that's creating a, a, a diversion of about a quarter of an FTE in staff time uh, toward doing that. But also the city is paying hauling fees uh, and uh, some not too distant past, uh, those recycled materials had value and uh, offset uh, the hauling fees. But unfortunately those commodity prices have diminished uh, and this particular 
um, line of business as it was uh, is at a level of expense that uh, is proposed uh, for this uh, for this elimination. So uh, with that, um, I think that uh, this demonstrates again the holistic approach. Uh, toward line of business changes that accumulate to $2.1 million and will help again bridge that gap. Uh, again, expect some comments and uh, feedback uh, in, in the uh, discussion period with City Council and happy to answer uh, any particular details or have uh, follow ups uh, going forward. Thank you. I have a question from Councilor DeMont. Thank you. Thank you. I see that and I think one right after that. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just curious on the the reduction, I had my notes that I was gonna ask about the reduction in hours for the rec center. So my question slash concern is, or is it a concern that if we reduce hours for people who say use those facilities that we're gonna push them to um, private industry and then, you know, kinda we won't see that business back, which I mean, I'm just curious if we're, we're thinking about that because I actually have heard people say in my community when, um, some of those started, you know, they signed up at some private gyms. So how do we see that impacting us long-term in those facilities? Thank you, Councilor Jamad. Uh, I, you know, I couldn't comment that on that specifically, but I do know that our uh, Parks, Recreation, and Library staff have uh, considered all the particular market forces that uh, certainly could be a result. But I think that's probably a follow-up item. I'm uh, just kind of looking through my notes in terms of what uh, uh, conflict or, um, market competitiveness could occur. So I think it'd be prudent for us to get a, a comment from our recreation team on uh, whether or not or how that was a part of their analysis. So I'll uh, I'll note that for a follow-up. Councilor, Great. thank you. And I think thank there's you. one more question if I have uh, Councilor Smith. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Smith withdrew hers, but you have a new one from uh, Mayor Pro Tem site. And uh, Mr. Dorf, if I could uh, jump in and I can, I can handle that. So the Mayor Pro Tem asked, um, can you please let us know exactly what is proposed to be cut in the lobbyist uh, contract? Does it include any other membership groups? Uh, so it's strictly the city's uh, state lobbyist uh, contract. Um, it, this does not uh, propose to uh, cut any other membership groups. I have a secondary question. I wanted to follow up on the, the questions from Councillor DeMont. And so there was, I had a similar thought process to him, although I wasn't worried as much, um, and, I, and perhaps I should have been, I just didn't think of it, um, of losing those customers. I just was wondering if these were represented as net savings or are they gross? Meaning, have we taken in consideration the lost revenue? So, um, you know, because if we, if we close certain operations, we're not going to get the drop in um, uh, revenue from that as well. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, we have taken into account the lost revenue. Um, so, so we do. Uh, well, the the gap slide is is a little bit rudimentary to to do that across the entire fund uh, financials. We have taken into account the impact on uh, recreation fees, um, recreation fees, and the service levels. Um, those will have. Okay. Those are my questions. I'll keep my comments till we get to the policy portion. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, just moving ahead, uh, and if it would be your pleasure, I'd like to carry over just a little bit beyond noon because I think we can, we'll work much harder to get through our content and then have a 30 minute lunch break. And then it will be open uh, for Council questions, comments, uh, policy discussion, and so forth. So uh, let us keep moving forward. And Mr. Lindsay, if you would uh, move me to the slide that is in review of fees and taxes, I want to uh, carry forward the discussion. Uh, Council, on, uh, at your August 24th study session, we provided due diligence information to you regarding potential change in uh, taxes uh, for City of Westminster. And that was a part of your due diligence and uh, bridging the gap and understanding opportunities for the city. Uh, related to that, uh, uh, there was this second bullet related to the cigarette tax exemption. And I described that in detail at your uh, study session as a measure that has been undertaken by both the state and the city of Aurora. And uh, it's our recommendation in this proposed budget that it would offer administrative efficiency and uh, create uh, in the big picture an incidental increase in revenue, but one that is a part of this proposed budget. Uh, so I wanted to point that out to you. Uh, also, uh, we are developing 
more information on changes to fees, and we'll be bringing those forward as they as they develop, um, and and would like to do that uh, in a holistic approach so that you can see how they interrelate. But uh, we'll also be bringing forth special rescue rescue fee structure. Our fire department will be uh, proposing that. Uh, we have about one uh, special rescue uh, per year for which. Um, you know, we are responding uh, in assistance to other communities and it presents an opportunity to collect a fee. So you you will have the opportunity to review that. Our Parks, Rec Recreation and Libraries uh, Department is undertaking a comprehensive uh, fee study to ensure competitiveness within the market and, and uh, sufficient recovery of costs. Uh, it has been a little while since uh, our city has reviewed its development fees and uh, assessed, but again, cost recovery and competitive in the marketplace. Uh, we'll further be evaluating our infrastructure fee and providing uh, information and background there that would that would in addition help uh, in closing the gap. And lastly, there's been some good discussion regarding transportation network companies and the idea that a lot of delivery um, uh, companies, transportation uh, driven are utilizing city infrastructure uh, and it's a time for us to continue to advance that. But I just want to say that uh, other than the cigarette tax exemption, none of those uh, are in this proposed budget just yet. We just have uh, quite a bit of work uh, to do around that. Um, so uh, if we could keep going, Mr. Lindsay, I think we've just got uh, a, a, pretty, a handful of slides and we can uh, conclude for a break. Thank you, uh, Mr. Doerr. Um, if I could circle back around to the gap in the pie that we've uh, been showing along. Um, to fill in that final piece of the pie, uh, staff is proposing a utilization of reserves in 2021. Um, so we're recommending to use $6.3 million of our general fund stabilization reserve um, to fill that last piece of the gap. Um, that recommended use of reserves leaves the total balance across those two formal reserves, general fund stabilization and the general or emergency reserve, uh, a balance between those two of uh, upwards of $17 million. Um, additionally, um, I, we noted on the slide, we've not proposed to use any general, or excuse me, we've not proposed to use either general reserve or 2020 carryover. Um, in 2021, um, but any carryover that happens to be generated um, would go to reduce that need to use the general fund stabilization reserve next year. I, I, if I could make two comments here, um, this is only possible because of your work the last five years to increase the um, general fund stabilization reserve. Um, I think you can look look over to the chart and see, you know, 2015 um, and the growth we've had since that time. Um, I, the additional note here would be um, the utilization of the general fund stabilization reserve um, next year. The proposed utilization um, would leave us above the amount that uh, we got down to during the Great Recession. So I want to circle back around to that 2021 gap concept. Um, so we talked about uh, $18 million in total gap, um, and then we've worked along the way on each of these different, uh, each of these different uh, methods to fill um, fill that gap um, and get us back to uh, a balance point for the 2021 budget. Um, we've spent a lot of time. Um, this morning talking about uh, the general fund and those related funds. Um, I wanted to speak just briefly about the utility fund. Um, I don't want anyone to think we're leaving uh, leaving those out. We do work a lot on those. Today's presentation, we definitely tailored towards um, where we're seeing the most revenue uh, impact uh, right now and we project into 2021. Um, but in the water funds, uh, as you're already aware, both water and wastewater proposed no rate adjustments, um, although the normal TAP fee adjustments will take place um, in 2021. And it's my understanding there's an info only uh, agenda item that will come to you in a, um, in a little bit, a couple of weeks on uh, the TAP fee uh, changes. Um, the transfers, um, transfer out of the water fund to the capital project reserve and a transfer 
um, into the wastewater fund from the capital project reserve. Um, just to clarify, they both they, we keep both those reserves uh, separate. But I think to the mayor pro tem's point earlier, um, I, I wanted to point point to this. This is um, this is how we intend to utilize those capital project reserves, and it just happens that we're uh, using those both in in uh, the two different ways in 2021. Um, you know, e each of those each of those funds operates uh, as a in a break even basis over time. Um, however, in an individual year, um, revenues may exceed expenditures or be less than expenditures, um, and this tr difference um, this difference is either uh, transferred over to that reserve to be used for capital projects later, or when it's needed for capital projects in a year, um, we transfer it over um, as we're showing in the wastewater fund. Um, the storm drainage fund, uh, we noted uh, a bit of this uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, but the storm drainage fund is actually very healthy. Um, we are proposing to reallocate both some salaries um, that are um, salaries of work that is done to benefit the storm drainage fund, uh, transfer those over, um, and also uh, utilize uh, the same methodology as we talk about cost allocation with um, water and wastewater fund and apply that to the storm drainage fund. Um, so storm drainage is paying in its portion of services um, received uh, that are provided by the general fund, like human resources and finance, uh, those sorts of things. Um, there's also a note in here, uh, just another uh, best practice change uh, for us, uh, moving the payment in lieu of use taxes that these funds pay. Um, that's normally noted in the capital projects section. Um, we've moved that over to uh, identify as an operating cost, just as a, a best practice um, type item. And then if I could invite uh, Teresa Boko to join us. To highlight the community budget requests. Uh oh, you're still muted, Teresa. Nope. Teresa, we still don't have any voice for you. Aaron Council, we, we apologize for some technical difficulties and Teresa's provided quite a detailed write-up in uh, your budget binder, which you have. And uh, Teresa, maybe we'll just give you one more uh, quick shot at it. Otherwise, Mr. Lindsay, will you uh, keep us moving forward? Unfortunately, we're just a little over our time budget at the moment. Teresa, no worries. I will uh, I will cover this. Um, let me be probably a little bit uh, a little bit briefer than uh, than you would uh, otherwise. Uh, let me uh, pull up my notes here. Um, so so let me note that the community budget requests are all um, in the uh, towards the back of the budget documents. I believe that's the last uh, the last section that's in there. Um, the city has a very thorough process around uh, community budget requests. Um, I, I we were talking with Larry about uh, kind of differences between us and some of the organizations. Uh, Larry's been um, with um, we've been uh, keeping an eye on those requests that come in um, during the year. Um, we've tracked those and provided uh, a fairly detailed staff analysis with each one, along with um, a recommendation. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, each each one of these. Um, because I think the detail is uh, is uh, very much uh, will hit those notes. Um, I think the one that we uh, 
promised that we would follow up with more information um, was the question about funding or the request for funding for uh, Medigap or uh, retiree health or medical um, for city sworn police department staff and uh, commissioned fire department staff. Um, so actually, uh, Larry, if you wanna join us again, um, Larry is going to go through this uh, because of his uh, extensive background uh, with this type of coverage. And uh, Larry, you're on mute this time. Goodness me, I apologize. And I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Teresa couldn't uh, bring that to life, but she's done a terrific write up uh, for us. And this, this is really just the last couple of slides here, uh, Mayor and Council. So um, if you would move that forward, uh, Mr. Lindsay, we had a question regarding Medigap and I wanna, I just wanna describe that first. And it's been often referred to as uh, in a couple of different ways with different words. And so I just wanna bring us all to the same uh, page. And the concept is that, uh, we are eligible for Medicare uh, at age 65 uh, in the country. Uh, obviously, I think uh, people know that, but it's worth bringing to life. Uh, but if someone retires before age 65, then we are on our own for providing our, our own medical coverage. We aren't um, eligible for a Medicare until age 65. Uh, so the concept, uh, you can call this, I, I have this lab slide labeled retiree health. The city does have a retiree health program and I'll describe what that is. Some people refer to this as retiree health, others Medigap. I think those two are uh, interchangeable because uh, the city's retiree health program is only uh, in place until you reach at Medicare eligibility at age 65, and then you're no longer eligible for the city's uh, retiree health program. So what this amounts to is medical coverage that's employer provided to a retiree prior to Medicare eligible. And so as you can see that statement there, whatever you wanna call it, it, uh, it really amounts to medical coverage. Um, currently our benefit as an employer is uh, our workers, if they elect to retire, uh, and they have at in, and they are any age and they have 20 years of service, they are eligible to participate in the city's retiree health program and the employee pays the full cost. Uh, or if the employee has at least 10 years of service and their age plus their years of service uh, exceeds the number 60. So, um, uh, that that kind of tells you the eligibility across uh, the city's retiree health program. Uh, it's a sustainable plan uh, because obviously this provides access to coverage and the employee pays the full cost uh, of access to the care. Um, we do have 35 participants uh, in the city's retiree health program at the minute. Uh, and I just wanna describe an implicit cost to that. While the employee pays the entire premium, uh, for the benefit, having that population of workers or retirees, I should say, that is on average older than the city's average worker, there is an implicit cost for providing coverage to uh, those individuals. So I just wanna put that on, those just kind of industry terms, jargon, understanding on the table so that we're all working from the same uh, set of understanding. Um, so in providing a, if, if the city were to change either its eligibility or its benefit, um, there are so many different variables that go into this. And I'll just describe a couple of hypotheticals with the idea that this is for council's discussion uh, and we can continue to build additional hypothetical cost scenarios. Uh, but ultimately the point of this is gauging the interest of council as a whole and then proceeding to next steps, would which would involve a professional actuary study uh, based on um, the framework uh, that uh, would be undertaken by council. And I would suggest that that would be driven generally by a study of the market potentially. But this is a great uh, starting point uh, to demonstrate what some of the potential costs may be. So here are some of the variables that go in. Uh, eligibility, uh, and again, age and years of service. Retiree participation. Because the benefit is available, we couldn't have guessed three, five, 10, 15 years ago that we would today in 2020 have 35 participants on the plan. Certainly many more are eligible. Um, so if the benefit is increased, then the assumption is that the participation would increase, but nobody can really estimate that because the demographic of our uh, retiree uh, eligible population is different than others. And that's where the professional study would tend to come into place. 
Uh, also, the amount of the benefit. Uh, with the presently, it is uh, all retiree paid. If that were to go to 25%, 50%, 75%, or 100%, obviously that would increase the total cost uh, to the city as well. So what I tried to do is uh, first uh, share with our uh, benefits consultant, Hayes, our population, our costs of, of uh, providing the benefit, and then get some estimates in a grid format on your next slide. And hopefully that sets forth at least a starting point for a discussion that can help uh, council decide if it would like to proceed to next steps, which would be understanding uh, the benefit at different levels uh, and uh, availability to different uh, populations. But this would really require the, the work of a professional actuary. We don't have that expertise on staff. So I just want to point out that these are hypothetical. Uh, so in the grid here, uh, this would be the average annual cost over the next 10 years because there's cost escalation and participation escalation. Uh, the assumption is that uh, eligibility would change from what I described earlier to 25 years of service at a minimum age of 55. And again, two variables that you could change to 10 other uh, different variables. And also assumes uh, that the premium will be $9,200 at the moment and escalate at an ordinary rate of inflation for the benefit. So with all of those uh, variables uh, put together, I've got two, two uh, well, a matrix here. First, police officers and firefighters only, and then all employees, you can read these for yourself and we'll be forwarding out the slides. Uh, and then the participation rate, which is uh, such a key variable. Uh, we just don't know if we'll go from you know, 10, 20, 50, or 75% participation. Obviously, the uh, more robust the benefit, the greater the, the participation, and the greater the cost. And I think that uh, most folks could kind of understand that. So this is sort of a first blush as to what some uh, different retiree health or Medigap costs could be. And so a next step is understanding the desirability on the part of council as a whole, and then perhaps uh, some professional studies and, uh, and also a market review. Uh, so with that, I think that concludes our slide presentation. Thank you for allowing us to go uh, some minutes over. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. And now we'll be able to proceed after this lunch break to answer any questions about specifics that you might have, and then really to get into your feedback proposed next steps and uh, areas uh, to explore further. So uh, with that, uh, I wanna thank you for um, allowing us to set forth all of this information and uh, hopefully present it in as clear a manner as possible. We realize that this is uh, much different than uh, what uh, has been done in the past, but hopefully it allows the council to focus on those policy choices uh, that will be most important in um, the city uh, having a successful uh, 2021 adopted budget. And with that, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council, unless you have any questions or comments, I'll uh, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thanks, Larry. Council, based on the time it is right now, in order to give you time, time to get uh, restroom breaks, lunch and stuff, we will reconvene at 1245. And I'd ask everyone to be back promptly so that we can get started. And then we'll try to uh, spend the next few hours after that going through the Council questions or comments. So at this point, it's uh, approximately 12.15. We'll go ahead and we'll adjourn until 12.45.
Matt, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Of course you can. <laughs> okay. I did what you asked about moving it from phone call to computer. Um, that seemed to help. And it was, I think you heard me this morning, correct? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I did ever hear you before the meeting started. Okay. Yeah. You know, I've seen that it, it seems like it's like a bug or something with go to webinar. Cause I know counselor Smith had that problem where okay. everything was right and it just wasn't picking anything up. And so that was the trick I found that, that fixed it for her, just changing the phone call and just changing back. So. Got it. Well, good to know future forward and. <laughs> yeah. Well, Larry, we're fixed now and we're still recording just by the way. So we did a, a mic test and he showed me a trick that um, helped Counselor Smith get past this. So I will look to you and Chris if you want me to do a quick recap on, on the first ones or if we just want to move forward, either way is fine. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks for your patience. I'm really uh, sorry that you weren't able to describe all your work there, but great work done. Great work in the binder and write up. And uh, should we have any questions, comments? Uh, absolutely. We'll just have you dive right in. So glad to know that you're online here and uh, enjoy a little break. And uh, we'll see you here at uh, quarter to the hour. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, no problem.
Hi, Mr. Mayor. Feeling better? Um, a little bit. It helped to eat a little. Let's see if I can right. keep it down now. Hang in there. Yep. <clears throat> Matt Williams, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Are we back? Are we still live stream? Or are you going to need to launch again? Yeah, we're still. I just kept it rolling to keep it one thing. So okay. we're we're still live. All right, good. Let me verify who's uh, back from council. See if we're able to restart. Councilor Demont. Yes, sir. Mayor Pro Tem Sykes. Councilor Seymour. Present. Councilor Scully. Here. Councilor Smith. Here. The Councilor Bowles. Here. All right, Council, we're going to be trying to deal with this uh, at the request of staff in two pieces. First of all, we'd like to try to capture all the questions that you have in regard to what's been presented. Some of those may be able to be answered now, some may not be answered till later, but the important part is to get all your questions available for the next round. Once we've uh, had everybody's questions, they uh, then we'll move into the policy portion after we get questions. The intent is to still try to wrap up uh, approximately 3 p.m. today. Mr. Tripp, you or your staff have any comments you'd like to make before we get restarted? Mr. Mayor, uh, Larry Dorr speaking. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to once again uh, thank you and members of City Council for our additional time to continue to evaluate our revenues and um, the overall economic environment. Uh, so that we can uh, be responsive and that this is this budget is a starting point and um, we think that uh, we will get some great feedback from you all and uh, we're happy to answer questions. I think we had one uh, regarding storage network, but I'll just defer to you and uh, which questions and what order and uh, Mr. Lindsay and I will attempt to either answer them directly or involve other staff or uh, we will just take those under consideration for future follow-up. Okay. Is there any member of council who would like to start with their questions? Mr. DeMott, go right ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and this will probably bleed over into the policy discussion, but I just want more thought around the <clears throat> storage area network. And and I may get a little into the weeds because it's my it's really my expertise is, is in that realm. So trying to understand, um, I think a four-year budget cycle is a pretty um, typical budget cycle for that kind of capital expenditure. Um, however, in my experience, oftentimes, you know, you're pushing, you know, you try for four years and usually press those out seven, eight, sometimes more. Um, most of those modern technologies are, you know, pretty, in line as far as speed and stuff. And obviously they get faster every single year that they come out and that's how they keep selling stuff. But I, I really am trying to understand why this year of all years that we would um, we would do that. And, and uh, if you have any kind of um, information on that. Thank you, Councilor DeMond. I'd like to invite Seth Plast to come up uh, with his camera or, or Mr. Lindsay, whoever we have our notes, of course, um, 
please understand that we're not the uh, technology uh, experts, uh, given our background in uh, finance, capital planning, et cetera, and civil engineering, but we'll uh, be glad to describe what we know, and certainly we can list this as, sure. a, and, as a follow-up. And, and there may need to be a follow-up as far as like what happens if we don't do it, because I, I imagine um, with that sort of hardware, uh, and it sounds like you, we were planning on keeping it and using it for alternative, um, for backup, which is, that's also very common. You, you know, a device like that has useful life past production. So if we were to push that off, say two, three years, um, what is the impact um, to, you know, to that department? And, and I have to imagine if it's only from 17, we should be able to extend the support and maintenance on it. Um, and does that have a budget implication or because you were planning on putting that for a, a use, were you gonna continue the support and maintenance anyway? So potentially maybe that's not even a, a, a budget consideration if we said, hey, we wanna continue to use this for, you know, at least through 2021, while we see what happens with the COVID crisis and you know what our budget looks like next year and potentially into the year after. Uh, yes, Councillor Demott, uh, thank you for the question. Um, just want to say first that um, we we shared your concern when it was initially uh, requested. Um, we then met with the IT department, uh, subject matter experts such as yourself, or similar to yourself, and um, we were able to gather more information and more detail on the project. Um, that led us to include it in the proposal. Um, as I'm looking through my my notes, uh, the warranty for the network um, is expiring this year. Um, we would be able to um, extend the warranty on some of the parts um, for one year um, at a cost of about a hundred thousand dollars. But some of the parts, um, in the SAN are eight to nine years old. Okay. Um, specifically, uh, they mentioned the trays. And um, IT department uh, said that they would not be able to get a warranty for any of those parts. And the impacts to that is the lead time if something were to fail. So if without, as you may, as you may know, if you have a warranty on um, some parts, then you're talking days instead of weeks on a, a lead time to replace the part. So the downtime is is impacted. Um, so in order, if we were to defer for a year, we would, at IT's request, um, replace those trays at roughly $40,000 per tray. So, so essentially, in order to defer one year, the cost impacts are about uh, three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand dollars just to defer one year, and then on top of that, in twenty twenty two, our understanding is that SAN um, or that that storage area network would need to be replaced as well at the tune of about uh, five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars. Okay, some of what you're saying makes sense, but I, what I don't understand is if we made it, what did we purchase in 2017? Because I can't <clears throat> think of a piece of, I mean, if we purchased like maybe, and, and this is getting into the weeds, but like this is why I want more information. Like if you purchase a new like controller unit and then we had all these old trays, I, I would question why we purchased it if, if we were going to life out the rest of the, the unit. So I just would like more detail around it because it doesn't, some of what you're saying could make sense, but it still, if if we could defer, even if, um, for example, if you say that you know we could warranty these parts and it would take longer to replace things if they if we had a failure, um, if I'm looking at something like that, I want to know like what kind of failure are we talking about, and do we still have redundancy, um, and how long does that redundancy last? Because you usually have multiple points of redundancy in that kind of technology. So, trying to get get a better full picture of it is going to be helpful for me um, as we look at our priorities in this budget. You know, for each of us individually, there's some things, um, you know, that I would push to not take out of the budget. Um, and this is one to me, seems like maybe we could have 
pushed it off a year. So if I could get more understanding around the the technical pieces of that, it'd be helpful. And and uh, I understand they they may not be it may be atypical that I'm asking at that level, but I just know this technology and <laughs> it's what I've done for 20 years. So I, I really want to understand because I've been in the situation where I'm asking for this stuff and being told no, in in the other place where I'm saying you know this is the right choice, but trying to get a full picture of that would be very helpful to me. Councillor DeMott, if I could add one one more piece. So sure. part of the part of the project um, is um, taking the existing storage area network and using it to replace a lot of the equipment at our disaster recovery site. Um, and the equipment at our disaster recovery site, site um, um, our IT director said they are really at the end of life. Um, so that this has a dual purpose. Uh, this project has a dual purpose also. Um, so it's, it's critical in a, in a couple of pieces, um, but we'll absolutely follow up with um, some more technical details for you um, and yeah. when that equipment was purchased. Yeah, no, and, and I think, again, everything what you're saying makes sense. I just, it sounds like the right project. I'm just questioning whether or not we could give it another year. And it sounds like there is, you know, you, there is that that break point where like, okay, well, yeah, we only saved this much. And then really over the long term, maybe we're not going to save it. So trying to really understand, and I guess the piece of it that doesn't really line up for me is the part, whatever we bought in 2017 versus things that are into life. Typically with, with IT hardware, you're not into lifing something after four years. You're usually being able to extend that on for quite a while, especially with something like a sand because they're so expensive. Um, and oftentimes organizations will push those out, you know, closer to an eight year mark. Um, I've done even past that. Not a preference, obviously. That's not usually what you want to do, but in times of hard budget, you know, that would be some something that you know, you really are looking at hard, which it sounds like you have, but I'm just going to need that so that I can figure it out in my head exactly how, how that whole list, that holistic look of, of why we're doing that. All right. Guys, I think you have an understanding of at least conceptually of what the Councilor DeMont's looking for. So let's try to move on. Next question, Dave. Right now, that's the only question I have. I think the rest of what I have is for uh, the policy area. So thank you. Councilor Bowles, you're up next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. My question would be, I've seen a couple different, it's around open space, <clears throat> the open space acquisition fund. I've seen a couple different numbers and just confirm for me what it is, I guess. Um, I've seen 1,366,000. And on page 81, I saw 1,458,000, which is, it? I, I'm probably somehow confusing those, but what, what is the amount for land acquisition fund? Councillor Folds, it's the uh, one million four number. Um, we had a we had a late number change and had a little bit a uh, little bit more that was available for that project. Okay, thank you. And that's very across much. that. Just to be clear, that's across two um, two different uh, two different funding sources. So it's in it's in multiple funds, um, but it's that one point four number. Okay, and then can you tell me how much? Is that 1.4, what percentage of the post fund does that relate to? Councilor Smith, while he's looking for that, are you asking about when does the open space actually expire? Okay, just wanted to clarify. So if I've done my math correctly and if somebody on my staff wants to check, um, that's about 15% of the, of the open space fund. Okay, good, thank you for that. Um, and then how does this yeah, amount? One Thanks, Thank Fred. you, Mr. Keller. I appreciate that. Uh, and how much does, remind me how much this relates to what we had in the budget in 18 and 19. Is it is it roughly similar? Is it a, a, a substantial increase or decrease or 
just by relation, how much did we have in that category? I guess it'd be an 18. In the last biennial budget, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Councilor, I don't have that uh, information in front of me. Um, Fred, do you happen to have that? I can, I can check it. Um, I don't have it really quickly. I could look at it while we're uh, fielding other questions, though. That's fine. Thank you. That's all I had on open space. I had some other questions, but I'll let others ask, and then I'll come back to other issues. So Let's, I'm done for If you have your questions available, Councillor Bowles, go ahead and let's try to wrap yours up. <clears throat> okay. Can someone tell me, so it looks like we've uh, decreased out neighborhood revitalization from the city manager's budget. Can someone tell me the thought process at some point, why we did that or why we're doing that? Or um, And then is the, the contract with CU is still, CU Denver is still in place. It's just the implementation that we're at, um, zeroing out. Um, so Seth, can you can you speak to the first part of the question um, and the second part of the question? The CU program, I believe. Um, let me let me check to let us check on that one, Councillor Vols. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to answer your first part of your question, the reason why uh, the neighborhood revitalization um, was not proposed to receive any funding in 2021 is that there is uh, $250,000 existing in the account and staff felt that was um, uh, appropriate or um, acceptable to um, continue to uh, move forward with the project. What, I'm sorry, what does that mean? I'm what do you there's, mean by that? There's $257,000 sitting there in unused that's already there. They're just not going to put any new money into it in 21. Correct. Oh, you know, so I read, I actually read the budget that we were taking that out, taking that to zero. That's not correct? No, I'm sorry. Um, we're we're um, not proposing any new funding, but the existing 250000 is still in the account. Oh, well, thank you. That. Thank you. Okay, that's a good answer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Glass. I appreciate that. And, and let's see. And and I would just add, and I think this goes back to a question the mayor had earlier, potentially about some of those major maintenance projects. In the in the detailed write up for all these capital projects, um, if something received zero funding, the very last sentence explains how much existing appropriation is is sitting in that project, and that led to a lot of these decisions. So in this in this particular instance, yeah, we note that there's two hundred fifty thousand dollars of appropriation that's still available for that for that project. So I, I did want to note um, note that work that the team put in there. Okay, well, thank you for that. That, yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do we need a budget for a possible recall election uh, next year, maybe $200,000 worth of a, a election that we have a, a petition floating around? Do we need to, to it's gonna cost at least $200,000 of, of city funds to do that? Do we need a budget for that? So we don't have it planned uh, to date. Um, I would offer that we have the general fund contingency available if that's something um, that does happen. Um, I, I honestly haven't haven't talked about this with uh, the city clerk um, to have a better read on that. Officer Volts, we'll try to get a number on that back to everybody, but we 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 wouldn't put it in the budget. What we do is we'd handle it through contingency, um, but I think a, a fair question for now is what is the cost of that? Um, and there are probably are a couple of variable variables with that, but we'll get you that answer on October 5th. And while I'm speaking, um, a number of these things we'll, uh, we'll take forward to October 5th and have the subject matter experts in the room when we do that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, okay, good. Um, then I had a question about, it looks like we're reducing, or, potentially reducing library hours is that first of all am i reading that properly because i maybe didn't read it right but it looks like we're going from 
seven days a week to six days a week. Is that correct? Thank you, Councillor Voles. Yes, that's uh, that's the proposal. Um, again, this is uh, uh, driven by our analysis of attendance and engagement with our patrons, and this uh, transition to digital activities. Of course, um, you know, in on-site services being but one of our uh, service delivery opportunities. But yes, that is the proposal that is on the table. Would it be a, ro a rotating concept where at least one of our libraries would be open every day? meaning they're not both closed on a Sunday or, you know, where one's open on Monday. So a resident would have an opportunity to go to a library every day. They may have to, on certain days, go to a certain one, you know, College Hill or Irving Park. Is there any detail around that yet? Or is it going to be that both be closed on Sunday or both be closed on Monday or? Just so that I'm real clear, I want to follow up on that, but I know that our, our staff is taking a very careful look at, uh, again, attendance, patronage, uh, and interact activities. Uh, I believe that they would have considered rotating, so at least one of the locations would uh, be open on a given day. So, uh, yes, I, but I, I just I will follow up on that. I believe that we will always have something open on one uh, given day, sir. It, it's just, yes, we will have one library open on every day. Okay, that's that helps me out a little bit with that. Okay, those are my questions for now. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answers, guys. And Gallup. Chris, can you can you confirm when does the current open space tax sunset? The current open space tax sunsets on twelve thirty one, twenty thirty two. Okay. And if I could refer back to uh, Councillor Vol's question on. Uh, open space land acquisition. Um, Fred was able to pull those numbers. Uh, 2018 was uh, zero. 2019 was $257,000. And 2020 was $175,000. Okay, good. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. That's helpful. All right. Ms. Smith, are you ready for your questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I got one of them answered, which was the post expiration uh, tax and when that sunsets. Um, so thank you for that information. Um, so I just want to be clear that because in the past few months, we've been looking at 18 to 30 million dollars in a financial gap. And I am gathering through this presentation today that we are solid on about 18.7 million, is that correct? Councilor Smith, thank you. Let me address that. And I should describe this concept of a gap. And the 18 to 32 million that we described on July 26th, that was our revenue decline. Uh, the gap between revenues and expenditures, we have increasing costs that have made the gap uh, more challenging. You, you heard a little bit about those related to body-worn cameras and uh, increasing uh, pension costs or that PPA, other things as well. And that, that uh, headwind in additional cost as well as decreasing revenue is, the, is really the difference. Um, we described our gap for 2020 at right on 18 million uh, and our gap for 2021 is 15 million put those two together, it's on the conservative end of the of the number. But of course, we described uh, this idea of what we're looking for in the future, right, in terms of what may happen around the holidays and in the, into the next quarter of next, first quarter of next year. And it's, we've approached this uh, with our guiding principles somewhat um, in a way that a household might approach an uncertainty with the idea of re curtailing expenses, um, pulling back on some of those short-term items, but not uh, you know, necessarily uh, selling one's home or car or taking the kids out of college. I know that I'm oversimplifying that, but I just wanted to paint a picture of a short-term analysis with an eye to the future as to what we may need to do to reduce our expenses uh, going forward. So uh, yes, it's a, we think it's a conservative approach. Uh, at the moment, but one that uh, is our best estimate with the information that we've got at hand. So uh, hopefully that answers the question in terms of the difference between revenue 
uh, decline and an overall total gap, the gap meaning increasing costs and how we're feeling that. Thank you for that. I, I'm sorry that I didn't understand that and didn't pick up on that. So thank you for clarifying. Um, the hiring process, um, when we say that we have a strategic hiring, um, back in July, uh, it was classified as a freeze. So, I, and it seems like we're kind of using the strategic hiring and freeze interchangeably. So what does that look like as far as um, if things start to look good, um, do we, does it have to come back to council to, um, I guess, approve these strategic positions that we are putting on hold? Um, how does that work as far as hiring? Thanks. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. And, and perhaps, Mr. Lindsay, if you, uh, well, I think we've uh, we've emailed out the slide, so I'll I'll just quickly try to uh, look at the number. I beg your pardon, but to answer your question, um, the word freeze is, I think, a little bit too restrictive. If something's either frozen or it's not, and I think from the very get go, we've described that police officers and firefighters were positions that we would seek to fill and recruit, and we've done that. We've had uh, uh, firefighter academies uh, conclude during this pandemic, uh, and also, as I mentioned earlier in my comments, we're recruiting for police officers at the moment on our website, and, and we'll continue to do that uh, unless there's some very dramatic change in the economy or in the public health situation. Um, so I think the word strategic uh, can describe a more agile approach. I also mentioned that we were recruiting for some techno for a technology position and we've got some um, applications in hand for dispatcher and so forth. So um, it falls into two categories. Um, one, we do have, uh, I think it was some 40 uh, positions Oh, now I'm seeing the slide. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Um, 35 regular benefited positions, they will not be budgeted in 2021. So in order to have appropriations and fill those positions, yes, council indeed will need to um, authorize appropriations to fill any of those positions. However, next month, uh, if a police officer, firefighter, dispatcher, or other position uh, were to come, become vacant, we have our strategic hiring process and uh, whereby our city manager's office is reviewing the critical business nature of the position, impact to the public in terms of service, and on and on. And those positions uh, would be budgeted. In other words, um, somebody who's in a job today and it becomes vacant in two months, um, that position will have a budget and appropriations and will undergo this evaluation process to determine the critical business nature and the uh, impact to the public. I hope that helps, but we've sort of got a little bit of each one. Great, thank you so much. And um, just two more quick questions. Um, the the body-worn cameras that we have um, for 650,000, is that for our entirety of completing that body-worn camera program or is that like a phased-in approach of how many cameras we're going to need? John uh, Prasner, could you come in and speak to that? Hi, that is for the entire program. Thank you. Um, my final question uh, is on the um, page 24 regarding the reserved fund balance. Um, if you could just walk me through that, because uh, it looks like our proposed ending balance would be that we would have three million um, in use of total reserves. Um, and I understand that six million comes from the general fund stabilization reserve. Um, but can you walk me through the process of how we got to those those numbers? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Councillor Smith. Um, so the that final number on the right side um, is where we would end the year with that much in uh, in reserve. And so the the difference between those two numbers, the uh, where we would end 2020 and where we would end 2021, is that six million dollar number. Um, there's a little bit of uh, of interest we believe we would earn during the year that would help offset a tiny a tiny bit of that gap um but that's where the six million dollar number comes from okay because it i mean the overall number is 
went from 82.4 to 79.5, which is about 3 million. Um, but our, our uh, general fund stabilization reserve is the difference of the 6 million. That's correct. And this chart shows um, all four of the reserves that are available across the city. Um, so those two that are down below, the, the um, utility capital project reserve and the utility rate stabilization reserve are also, um, also have um, some change happening there as well. Um, so that's why those, uh, that's why you see the, the grand total at the very bottom shift because it includes those other, okay. uh, those utility reserve funds. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. That's all my questions. Air Pro Tim Sykes. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thank you everyone for this um, really comprehensive um, work that you've done to try to a predict what our revenues are going to be um, in 2021, and then try to bridge the gap. Um, so uh, I, I do appreciate the work. I'm going to try hard right now not to get into policy questions, but really just questions on what's been presented. Um, obviously, your discussion today was much more high level than what we received in our binder. So please forgive me some of the questions you didn't discuss today that are in the binder. Um, I do have a quick question on one of the in the capital improvement program in regards to the promenade renovation phase one, which is a million dollars. Like to understand what that program is and why that's a priority this year. I feel like we've, <clears throat> as a council, um, while I didn't support this, I feel like we've done a lot to already support the development there and I'm kind of worried about spending additional taxpayer dollars there. My apologies. Um, hit, the, hit the screen button instead of the camera. Um, so, so first, um, Seth, would you would you come on and uh, be available to uh, to help me out um, as well? Uh, so, I, I would just note uh, one part of that uh, project is to replace the um, replace the pond liner um, on on. Uh, several of the ponds that have existing leaks. Um, so part of that is a um, uh, repair and replace um, type project. Um, Seth, will you help me out with the, with the rest of that project? Well, it's my understanding that this um, request for 2021 would cover most of that um, uh, fixing that leak that's in the pond currently that's causing operational issues for the parks and um, recreations and libraries department. Um, I think that the plan is a multi-phased approach that may not get into the necessarily the amenities that it, it's it's discussing. That okay. answers your question. It, it does, it does. And obviously a leak is a, a real problem. So that needs to be addressed, so thank you. Um, Similarly, and we don't need to get into each of them, but there are kind of a lot of parks and recs um, program, like capital programs, such as city park, pickleball courts, that sort of thing. Similar question, we don't need to go into each of them now, just probably want to understand why those are time critical um, and, and wanting to invest in this year, in, especially in comparison with a lot of the stuff that is taken out that seems to align um, with our strategic plan, maybe a little more closely. Um, <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem, so can I respond a little bit to that? Um, we, we, um, Seth hit on this a little bit, but I, I do want to clarify. So, um, a number of the revenues that support uh, Parks, Rec, and Library uh, Department um, projects are restricted to um, uses in those areas. Um, and so they're not necessarily available to cover gaps that are elsewhere. Um, either they have to be spent on gaps, or, excuse me, they have to be spent on uh, capital capital uh, assets. They have to be used in um, specific counties on park projects or open space projects. There's a number of limitations on those. Um, so so um, I, I would say while it, while it might appear that, that um, we're 
doing projects um, while we are having to make cuts everywhere. And I, I, I understand um, that viewpoint. Um, some of those revenues are limited to those types of projects anyway. So I would, I, I would more put that we're, we're taking advantage of, of uh, every dollar that, that there is and using those restricted, uh, restricted funds to additionally gain some, gain some value as well. Great, and that could be part of the answer. I know that um, Mr. Plass did go into that in detail, that some of the things that are actually cut out are also parks recreational. And so if it's, it needs to be done in capital versus operating, that's a great answer to it. Um, but these are gonna be the things our residents ask us. And so I need to feel very well versed in how we prioritize them um, to be able to communicate to our residents accurately. Um, so, and again, we're gonna be talking about the, the policy portion of this at a later date, which I can get into at that point. I have some really additional pointed questions in regards to what were the priorities for, um, that, that were used. Um, I, I'm looking at the conservation program and I appreciate that it is for um, water efficiency audits and retrofits and income restricted um, residences. I was wondering, are we still intending to keep our turf buyback program, potentially expand it? Um, you know, water and water rates has been something that our residents have been very vocal about. Uh, Councillor Voles has kind of illustrated how vocal they've been about it. And I want to make sure that we are still um, emphasizing um, assisting people um, in, in meeting those needs or meeting those new costs. So do, is turf buyback still included in this budget? Seth, can you respond to that question? In the, um, excuse me for one second as I find my notes from Public Works. And I recognize the budget that we were presented was it was an interesting level, right? It wasn't super high level and it wasn't in the weeds. So there, you know, it's not a, a we didn't get a line item of everything that's in public works, you know, budget. So I'm, I'm presuming it's in there, but I just wanted to verify. Barbara, you had Barbara, your hand. Yeah, this is Barbara Obi, if I could pop in real quick. Uh, we don't currently have a turf buyback program. We are working with residents on their irrigation systems. And this is one of those additional component programs, of conservation. That is something that we are working on um, studying and piloting, but we don't have that currently in our repertoire. That's interesting. Public Works told me this was the first year we did it and we sold out. That was from uh, Public Works. I apologize. I can confirm, but I, I will verify. All right. So they owe you an answer back. Do you have another question? I do. I have a series of them. Um, So one of the things, these questions, I don't want them to get into the policy level portion of it, but I did want to ask um, in regards to the um, the taking away of the recycling centers. Um, I understand that it, we had a, a dollar amount that was listed for it and then a plus two, two five FTE. And I'm just curious if we have the cost for that FTE um, somewhere figured out. I know that this is partially a cost avoidance situation. Uh, thank you for the question. We don't have a, an individual directly cost allocated to this function. Unfortunately, due to the lack of monitoring, we've had to adapt to um, what's happening at our center at our recycling center area so we've diverted existing staff away from other roles and duties and uh, folks who are uh, trained in skilled labor and so forth it's not any one person it's it, it there are trade-offs and typically we're trying to respond from uh, the unsightly uh, issues that occur and sometimes those are sporadic so that will not be what we will do is redirect those people back to their core responsibilities and functions and and you know we've estimated about 500 hours a year uh, dedicated toward remediating those uh, issues at the recycling center so if that is the only cost savings that's proposed is just related to the hauling we would keep uh, because again it's it's a number of people contributing to that 500 hour a year response so we would just reallocate those people to 
uh, their primary functions and or uh, backfilling other vacancies and so forth. So that's the issue with the FTE. Well, I'll probably want to discuss that a little bit more um, at a, at a, when we get to the um, to the other portion of this. I did want to ask on the revenue projections. I noticed with the HUTF um, that we only predicted, I think, a 10% decrease in those funds coming to us. How do we come by that number? Because everything I've heard is that fund in general is about 30% down. If I may, I forgive me, but I just looking at my notes, I believe it's from four million to three million, which would be about a twenty five percent decrease. Uh, and maybe Chris, you could source those exact numbers while we're talking about it. But I will tell you this: uh, we not only do our own estimates as a city revenue department, but the Colorado Municipal League uh, does significant uh, economic analysis and research around HUTF. They uh, involve other economists and so forth, and they put out quite a robust. A report on Highway Users Fund, and uh, we consider that along with our own analysis, recognizing uh, the volume of streets and the formula that's involved in determining the Westminster allocation. But Chris, did I did I remember from top of hand, mind it was from three to four, and that that's about twenty five percent? I'm going to jump in here because I just want to read it since it was corrected. Um, it did say that in um, 2018 and 19 it was at 4.4 million, but that was because of some one time monies that were added to it, and that it's typically 3.5 to 3.6 million. Thank you. So since those were not anticipated to be recurring revenues that were added to it, it does seem like it's only a 10% drop from what is more standard. So I can jump in on this. Um, when we look at the numbers, we look at past trends, it's usually pretty stable with HUTF. Obviously, we're expecting some disruptions with driving habits, which impacts gas tax that flows into the fund and then distributed. Um, so using some actual data, uh, historical data, we came up with trends and then backed out the one-time revenues and then dampened the projection a little bit and then compared it to the CML projection. And we came in slightly higher than they did at first. So then we dialed it back a little more to more reflect what CML had distributed and publicized for uh, going to Westminster. Okay. Um, I was on the Dr. Cog call on Thursday, and it does appear that that HUTF is is significantly impacted. Um, so I guess I would keep our eyes on it because may, maybe I'm wrong, but I would be surprised if um, people's choices for you know coming to work change permanently. I have not been back in the office since COVID hit. You know, so I think there's going to be a lot more people who working remotely is the way of the future, and that is going to have an impact on gas tax collection. So just was concerned about that, um, recognizing it's not the end all be all and recognizing all of this is subject to change and we have a very uncertain landscape in front of us. So I, I recognize that completely. I'm not going to hold you to any of these dollars, but I just wanted to highlight that I have concerns about that. Um, that said, I think most of my questions from here on out are really more policy um, related, um, and I'll be happy to address those after I've allowed other people to ask very specific questions about the proposal in front of us. Um, I, similar to Councilor Voles, um, curious about the library situation. I was happy to hear that there'd at least be a day um, going forward every single day of the week would be covered. People would just have to change that. That does make me feel better. Um, and then open space, I, I'm happy to see that we're increasing the, the spending there. Councilor Scully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, staff. You, I, this is very good. Um, I, I have actually appreciated the level it was, this presentation was at, um, as someone who thinks a little bit more, I'm, I'm more of a high level thinker. Um, which came out in our, our recent retreats. Um, so this was very helpful to me. The explanations are very clear. Um, I do have some questions. Um, so when we were talking about positions not being filled, um, I, and thank you, um, 
Councillor Smith, for for your question. It kind of helped me understand this a little better, but I, I want to go just to, just one step further on it. Um, I understand 35 positions will remain unfilled, um, but there are other positions because if I do my calculations right, if we're not going, to, if we have 4.5 percent um, currently not filled that's about 81 to 100 positions so so are we going to continue to look to fill those other positions and then just not fill the 35 or um so i, I was just curious about that i i understand that there are positions that have to be filled that that is something i i truly get um but i was just curious um if we were planning to fill those positions Councilor Scully, thank you for the question. I, I'll just try to uh, answer this from a holistic point of view that um, I think both our revenue experience uh, and cost saving measures meshed with uh, what vacancies come about uh, and the current service loads uh, for the community will drive our, our decisions in filling positions. And of course, we'll uh, continue to update uh, those choices as we uh, navigate through COVID-19 in our regular reports. So I'd like to say that there's a very clear and specific uh, path toward filling and not filling positions. But uh, for the moment, we've just got our current vacancies and our current um, snapshot or picture landscape uh, that we will that we've uh, carried forward uh, into our 2021 budget, uh, and then we just have to really navigate uh, what additional um, retirements, resignations, uh, staff changes come about in the future, and we'll just continue to monitor and and report how that may impact services and how that's helping in terms of our cost savings, and then as our cost savings need changes with our revenue. Um, experience so those those things are I, I think significantly interrelated and we'll just continue to monitor and report and okay. and one of the reasons we're calling this our strategic plan as opposed to hiring freeze which isn't necessarily as agile or or as, as thoughtful we think yeah and and i agree with you freeze is a very harsh term um it applies to many that that's it we're just not hiring um i know front range went with frozen not or frost we're frost we're in a frost not a freeze um, which i kind of liked it was a softer way of saying it um, and it it does lend to their still hiring going on um, and I, I think that can be very confusing to residents when they get on the website and they see um, positions open or that we are recruiting for certain positions so so maybe a little bit of communication on the web page that explains how we are going about not hiring and how we're going about hiring um, just so residents are very clear and don't feel that we're not following our own selves and that that might have been more of a policy discussion i apologize um, another question i had was about the seasonal workers i know that um, I, I sit on the parks recreation library open space board and as a liaison for this council and um, i know that they did not hire a number of seasonal workers as a way to um, cut budgets and um, increase, you know, increase use of revenue in other areas. Um, and, and I'm a bit confused because um, I know next year we'll be in the same boat because um, we it'll take us time to recover. Will we be doing the same thing or do you think we'll go ahead and hire those seasonal workers back or has that been discussed or is that just a later date discussion? Thank you. I appreciate the question. There's a lot to that, and uh, it's it's there's some complexities. I think I'd like to hold that for a discussion on October 5th. I think what you'll find is, as we're beginning some openings in some places, we're mapping people with skills to those kinds of roles where we can. That's becoming more and more tricky, uh, but I think you can, and to complement that, I think you can anticipate that we will be filling some seasonal positions as we start to open uh, some facilities here in the fourth quarter. So it'll be a mix there again, but I think I'd like to, to put more detail to that. It'll be useful, and then also we'll be able to track uh, going forward, our actual experience versus maybe what our plan is. So uh, if I may, I'd like to defer that as another uh, to do for October 5th. Thank you. Okay. Um, we also talked about capital projects that we are not going to complete. And um, I, 
I get it, you know, we've got to make cuts somewhere. Um, but I do have a concern about the municipality court that um, we're putting on hold um, because we've been told over and over that that building is almost unsafe. And um, so I'm curious, um, I, how far out are we putting that on hold? Is Do you think we'll revisit that in 2022? Um, do we have other ideas of maybe we could move them into other facilities? I, I don't want to put our our employees um, in danger and harm's way. And I know that building is is old. I know that it's got lots of problems. So I'm just curious um, what our thoughts are on that. Councilor Scully, I'd like to invite uh, Deputy Opie into the conversation. And Barbara, what I'd like to do is maybe just, um, if you would, highlight the thoughts that we've had about the potential privatization, uh, some sort of a private partnership model on this. I want you to know that we just have not had time this year to move forward with the kind of study we'd like to do, but we, since we knew that money was going to be uh, probably victimized by what was going on in our current economy, uh, we certainly have been talking internally about what is, the, what is a better potential model and this all falls within Barbara's responsibility. So Barbara, go ahead. Thank you, John. Um, so to, to address that issue, one of the things that staff has been doing, um, as you may recall, city council authorized us to um, work with a P3 contract um, consultant to help us look at whether um, public-private partnership might be a viable option. So that is one area we are researching. Um, we actually uh, recently met with them and went through some possibilities and how they could help us frame that. So there, there are options that we are continuing to pursue and research. Um, as, as Don had mentioned, we haven't been able to deep dive as much as we would like to into that area, um, but we do have staff and general services working on this with the outside consultant trying to identify, are there possibilities whether P3s might be an option or are there other ways that we could finance this to allow it to proceed? But we do recognize that it is an uh, important component that we need to address. Um, but it is unfortunately not a very inexpensive proposition to build a new facility. And so we are continuing to research that, but our general services director, uh, Matthew Boko and his team is working diligently on this idea. Okay, thank one you. Of the things that, one of the things that I've heard from some of you and I've heard from also uh, our economic development real estate folks are that there are buildings within our city that have been vacated because they're no longer viable uh, in the changed economy. And many of those are very big box buildings. So I think there's some potential to this idea here. Um, and we also would like to maybe look at this sort of development being something that would initiate some other tax base. So um, I, I just wanted to provide, without any real detail, some assurance that um, we're very committed to finding a solution to this. And at this point, we're really committed to doing it with as little city money as possible because of our situation. And I do think there's some options out there. Thanks for the question. Thank you. I, I love that idea of thinking outside our box a little bit. Um, you're right. We have people who are not going to be returning to their offices and that's going to make a lot of open space available. And so I think the idea of looking at maybe, um, occupying older spaces that are maybe in better shape than our current building would be very, very helpful. So I appreciate that. And that kind of lends to my next question. Um, I really appreciated the breakdown of everything in this report. It was very easy to read. And, and I apologize if I have missed it in any way, but what I did not see was a breakdown of external funding that we receive and, and that we can use for applications, such as grants, um, federal aid, state aid. Um, I, I know there's not a lot of federal aid, but, but I know there is some. And um, you know, how does that break down and how do we use that? And, and what do we anticipate we will be getting in the next year? Um, we got CARES funding this year from our counties that was very helpful. Um, I know that we have done ad, ADCO grants for parks. Um, I know there are grants out there for our utility um, that we might be able to tap into if we have not already. I, I'm assuming we have, but I'm just curious. And, and we talk over and over about not um, just relying on our our tax, sales tax, sales and use tax revenues. 
Um, so I, I guess I would be curious if we could get a list of all the other funding that we do utilize and, and how we are using that funding as well. Thank you for the question, Councillor Scully. Um, I think we can provide a list. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going through my head. I'm thinking of a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, funding sources that that roll into um, uh, what is what ultimately shows in the in the um, budget document is intergovernmental revenue. That's the line where that flows into. But there's a lot that's there's a lot that's within there. Um, I, I would also just um, caution uh, some of these grants we can't uh, budget for. Um, the expenditures before we receive the revenue um, due to complexities of uh, federal grant revenues. Um, so a lot of times you see those as a supplemental appropriation after the fact. Um, so, so I think we're cautious and um, I, I would say staff's aggressive at going after every funding, funding stream we can, um, but we will definitely um, see what we can provide you in terms of grant funding streams that we take advantage of. And, and any external funding source that we might take advantage of. I know most of the time it comes in the form of a grant, but I know there are other options as well. So I'm just looking for um, other sources of income because that is something as a council, we have said over and over that we want to be looking for. Um, and so I'm just curious, you know, how are we doing that and what are we finding and, and how can we show that to our residents so that our residents understand that that we're trying not to depend actually on our sales and use tax. I know that's like, that's a very high goal that we, we probably would never be able to completely achieve, but, but that we are um, cognizant of how much money we ask of our residents to contribute to our city to keep it in the shape that, that they all enjoy and I enjoy. So how do we look for those other sources? Um, I have one last question. This one might be more of a policy question, but um, we have water rate workshops coming up in October and November, um, where we're going to have um, four days of conversations for water rates. And um, I think that we have heard from our residents loud and clear that we need to revisit this topic and we need to think about how we are um, handling our utility, and it it, ha, it seems to have it concerned all kinds of different things, from the meter implementation to the rates to the tiers to the billing. Um, so, I definitely this is something we need to look at. Um, how have we planned for those workshop outcomes in this budget, or have we? Are we just going on the assumption that nothing will change, and we will just continue? on this path, or are we actually anticipating that we might have to do some adjustment after we've done these workshops? Thank you, Councillor Scully. We would not uh, want to presume any outcomes. Uh, so in the city manager's proposed budget, we have not made any uh, presumed changes or any proposed changes in this particular budget. So the answer real briefly is no. Okay, and, and that's fine. Um, it, if we do adjustments through the year on any part of our budget, um, do, we, do we have any kind of plan in place of what happens if we decide to do an adjustment somewhere? Something doesn't get passed or we don't approve something or um, God forbid another round of COVID hits. Um, you know, do we have a plan in place? Council has done that before. It was described earlier, should there be some type of special election that there would be contingency funds, but council does have the opportunity to make supplemental appropriations, just as was done this uh, earlier this year with CARES Act funding. Uh, should we come into those kinds of resources, then council would have the opportunity to make supplemental appropriations or de-appropriations, uh, as has been done in the past. So we'll remain agile to those kinds of things, and our plan is to, is to do just that is to uh, really uh, uh, anticipate these things as best we can. And I think the one that I was, uh, that I was really, uh, that I am really focused on and thinking about from an economic standpoint, is really the holiday shopping season and what that really means in, in terms of revenues and such like that. So uh, we'll remain uh, poised to do those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, the holiday shopping, I have to be really honest, the holiday shopping kind of makes me nervous. Um, just because I know people are not really going out and shopping. And so um, 
I'm a little worried that we may lose some revenues. Um, do we, do we, I know that there was a, a state legislature bill last year, I believe that talked about helping us collect revenues from online sales as well. Um, so we'll be able to use that money, correct? Yes, you're talking about the Wayfair case, and uh, similar. And we are, of course, as a city, collecting significant sales taxes from online transactions, and we're seeing quite a growth there. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we have pretty good confidence here uh, about the holiday shopping season because so many people have opened their first. A prime Amazon Prime membership. So many people have gotten their first groceries delivered during the pandemic, and we think that that will carry through to this uh, fall and winter season, and hopefully the holidays. And we we also note that a lot of discretionary income that isn't being spent on, let's say, airline travel or or other family household type of expenditures, are transitioning into home improvements and uh, other things that uh, will present themselves during the holiday season. So I think, given that we've had a few months months now of this uh, activity with some uh, cracking of the valve uh, to reuse that expression again that there's some there's some reasons to be uh, positive about the economic activity so um, we will remain poised to adjust to those uh, in in the positive or the negative thank you very much you, you can tell I have a little helper <laughs> That's that, all awesome. okay. that is all all right, Councilor Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, some of these questions, I apologize to my fellow counselors. Some of these are just questions that are general budget questions, um, being this my first deep, deep dive into this. And so I had some of these two that they can be answered offline. Uh, I know we have a lot of time to go through today, but I just wanted to say too, I, I concur with Councilor Scully on, on concerns over our court building. Um, so, um, that I'll put that there. I, I do have a question though on, on, on page nine with our, uh, budget summary by fund, um, on the utility rate stabilization reserve. I note that we have, uh, uh, we'll have a balance in there of 23 million round numbers. And in 2021, we'll look to add 11, four to that, uh, for a full, um, at the end of 2021, uh, $34.5 million. Is that money um, only used for uh, rate uh, fluctuations or is it ever transferred to um, capital improvements? Mr. Lindsay, would you make a comment on this? And uh, I think rate revenue stabilization uh, is likely connected directly to that, but would you talk about what may have happened in the past, sir? Um, so the city has a um, council adopted policy um, for both the rate stabilization reserve and the um, capital project reserves. Um, I am not aware of a time where we've transferred out of the rate stabilization reserve um, for capital projects, um, but we will definitely check into that. Uh, I would just say in general, the purpose of the rate stabilization reserve is to um, account for, uh, especially with the utility when we have a dry year. Um, so something that's that's uh, fairly unexpected, water use goes down, or how about what, excuse me, I got the wrong, I went the wrong way, a wet year, um, apologize. Uh, when we have a wet year um, and the effect that that has on uh, water usage and then uh, and then on the wastewater utility as well. Um, so that is that is the true purpose of those. We'll check into whether or not we've used them from capital before. And I will have to honestly look at the policy to see if, it, if um, it's within the council adopted policy to use those for um, capital. Thank you. And, and offline, um, if if I could uh, get some numbers on uh, the most we've ever had to take out of that during a, a wet season. That's for later, not for now. Um, policy question. I had a, a question on some interfund transfers on page 25 specifically. Um, golf course fund uh, to the golf course fund. 
Uh, it looks specifically to the preserve at Walnut Creek. This is about two thirds of the way down, an operational subsidy of $281,600 um, in 2021. Um, do we use that to offset um, our plane fees mostly versus operational costs? Uh, we use that to offset the debt service payment uh, for the okay. course. Okay, thank you. Um, then uh, I'm looking at the utility debt fund on page 31 uh, of the book. And I, I just wanna to confirm too that, and, and I, I'm throwing a lot of numbers out, so I apologize. Um, these can be shot to me offline too. It looks as if between 2016 and 2020, we've added 112.3 million dollars in debt to the utility fund. So I wanna, if someone could confirm that later with me. Let's see, that's policy question. We will confirm that with you. Thank you. Uh, and then um, Mayor Pro Tem Sites uh, had the question on the recycling centers. Um, So a great part of this decision was the fact that also that we're, we're paying haul off fees because the value of the recyclables has dropped to nothing. Is, is that correct? Councilor Seymour, we'll, we'll provide some information on uh, the receipts from those recyclables going forward. Absolutely, thank you. All uh, right. So many of these are policy questions. So, and and on um, when we get into our discussion of uh, cigarette tax exemptions, um, if we're going to go that direction, um, just like to know where our neighboring cities are because that you know could be a transfer issue if they can walk across the street and save money. Um, it just refocuses that. Uh, that is just the specific dollar questions I have. I'll, I'll save the rest for. Uh, policy section. Thank you. Councilor DeMott, is your name in for the policy discussion or do you have another question? Um, I have another question. So if Councilor Rolls wants to go first, I don't think he's had a shot. Yeah, he was up. You're up. So let's go. Okay. Um, so two, two quick things. So the four communications workers, I'd like to know um, a dollar amount that those will cost next year. And then the other thing um, that I, and if I missed it inside the slides or in the book, I apologize. The chief innovation officer that was part of the $1.9 million approval um, year and a half ago or so, is that still in the budget? Where is that in, in this? And is there a savings because we're not hiring or is that still budgeted? Those are the two um, numbers questions I had. Got that, Councilor Demont. We'll uh, we'll get some exact numbers on the four positions and uh, chief innovation, sir. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Same question. Do you have a question, or is this in the policy discussion? I had a question, real quick. <clears throat> I think I found it though. Actually, um, I just want to confirm our parking management fund. We're not contributing to that this year, correct? We're anticipating that that will pay for itself, meaning the 699,000 such and such, that that's money in and money out, but we're not contributing. There's not an appropriation for that fund this year. Is that correct? Um, there is an appropriation and there is a transfer from the general fund to subsidize that fund. I thought when I asked that question, when we created this fund, my question was, is it anticipated that it would pay for itself? Is that because it's in its first year or is, if we have a parking management fund, it seems like the parking fees would pay, cover the cost of that fund or am I not following, not tracking? So I think that's the anticipation over the long run. Um, the, um, I, I don't know when we will get to full cost recovery on that. Um, I also think with the closure of businesses this year, we've seen less parking revenues. And in fact, I think you would, um, I think you would see that on uh, page 16. 
um, where the fund is uh, um, where the fund is laid out there, but the the inner fund transfer revenue source that's the that's the money that's coming over from the general fund. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll have a policy discussion on that one. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Has everyone had a chance to ask the questions they want? And we'll move on to the uh, policy discussions. Who would like to start? Mr. DeMont, are you ready? Sure, I'll go first. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, I always go first. I was trying to give one of the rest of you a chance to be the first one to cause trouble, but whatever. Um, so a couple things, probably not surprising to anybody. I, I'm really don't like the idea of getting rid of the one the one canine and the the motorcycle officers. I mean, I understand it and that we have to make cuts, but you know, there's some other areas where I'm curious if the cuts make more sense. So that's why I would like to hear um, dollars around the communications people. Um, I'd like to know about the SAN um, to see if that's, you know, if that really needs to happen this year. Um, so I don't really have any questions. Those were kind of my starting points of things that I'm, you know, would like to address. The other area that I am curious about is on just on implementation uh, timing of the body body worn cameras. So I'm a, you know we were in talks of this for a while, um, and I remember a presentation I think prior to the last election even where we had had looked at this. So I'm curious on timing why we're deciding to move forward now um, versus the the allotted time that we're given. Uh, what's you know the thought behind that? specifically when we're in such a budget crunch um, and do we think in the and this is one of those I guess crystal ball questions but do we think that there's going to be any kind of movement one way or another around some of the legislation with 2217 starting next year I'm already hearing a lot of a lot of um, you know noise that they're probably going to go back and work on some of that stuff so i don't know if that means changes to it or longer implementation times but i'm just curious with us being in such a crunch uh, why we're deciding to go forward with that now um and then I guess the only other thing that I have that I'd like discussion around, if any of my colleagues are interested, is I would like to talk more about the Medigap because I think we are seeing other um, agencies do that. And as you know, things have been with policing, that's going to become more difficult to get people, good quality people, in that industry. Um, and we're going to, you know, that's one of those areas where we need to maintain being competitive with our neighboring municipalities to be able to retain, retain and attract good quality people into that, um, that, that field. And I think that you're gonna see the same with fire because my understanding that's something that's gonna be looked at for those type of organizations with the jobs they do and you know it's rough on them and you know having that that uh, gap in between of medicare and that retirement age so um, i think that i'd be in favor of having a bigger policy discussion around that and you know maybe that's a long-term discussion but i think that we need to have that discussion other comments mr lamont is that it no not this all right Councilor Smith, are you ready? Sure, I wasn't in the queue, but I'll go. <laughs> um, so I do have actually one more question. Um, brought, it was came up with uh, Councilor Demont uh, in looking at motorcycle uh, police officers. Um, can you clarify whether or not that's an that were were taking away just motorcycles and not positions. Cause the way I understand it, or oh, the way I read it was that we weren't going to replace the motorcycles, but weren't cutting 
positions. Did I understand that right or wrong? Uh, Councillor Smith, that's correct. On uh, page 43, I think we, we hit on that. Um, this would maintain the number of uh, officers, but reduce the number of motorcycles. Okay. And, okay, I'll, um, since we're past the question part, um, I'll, I'll have to look more into, um, you know, what that, that means. I'm not for um, cutting positions in um, our police department, um, but if we need to uh, look at other ways of um, utilizing transportation around the city, then um, I don't mind looking further into that. Um, I would like to keep our canine. I think that's uh, important and very necessary in um, a lot of different ways just for the city in general. Um, the other one that I would like to uh, take note in is, and then really just kind of dive into, uh, and my fellow counselors have mentioned it quite often in our talk uh, today, but uh, we have mentioned that we have a capital improvement program for the 120th Avenue transmission water line. Um, and then the, the, the justification for that was the recent water line breaks suggest that the water line is in need of replacement sooner than the 2026 replacement. Uh, and I know that we had a community request uh, to focus and look on the water replacements down on 72nd. And um, part of our, part of the staff's request to um, defer this was that we have a scheduled program that identifies what areas need replaced and when. Um, but I don't feel comfortable um, with water line breaks at 120th um, to have us move up those projects for that area and not move up because of the water breaks down on 72nd um, to not look at that closer and move that up. Um, so I would suggest us kind of looking at that and then the the repairs and the the full replacement that we could do with those um so those are the top of mind um i'd like to i know that we're going into water rate discussions um well not water rate but just the water in general uh in october uh, so i'd be very curious to um have a better understanding of that and how this would affect our 2021 budget um, and what that looks like for utilities and um, replacements and that. Um, so these are just top of mind things right now um, and I'll just defer my time for the rest of the counselors. I'm sure something will come up and I am happy to put my name back in the queue. So thank you very much. Councilor Seymour, sorry I missed your jumping in. No, oh, it's fine, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, just just a, from a policy standpoint, um, I, 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 while I'm pretty conservative with the back end, I, I, I do appreciate the optimism um, of, of the 98% of revenues. Uh, having a retail location and being able to see out into the activity in our community, it has increased greatly. Uh, the amount of, of uh, uh, contractors that are out and about and work, doing work in our city uh, need to make sure they all pay that use tax as they're doing that. But um, I've seen a substantial uptick in that also uh, from from my business perspective. And then also uh, activity at large regional malls is picking up significantly. Uh, I can attest to that. And so we we have optimism for that. Um, well, some of some of our residents. Um, have lost their jobs temporarily or in some cases permanently. Um, it, it, the detrimental effect of that and the offset of the online sh uh, shopping looks to be moving ahead. And I think um, I'm optimistic from that is that uh, while some people are traveling, uh, it's still not uh, full airplanes or locations. And so people are spending their money at home. So um, I'm looking forward to a, a great rebound in uh, 2021. So I thank, thank uh, staff for that. A um, couple, of, uh, couple of the policy questions. I, I'm actually going to save a couple of them 
for our water wastewater um, discussion because I think that would be more appropriate from that standpoint. Apologize, let me. Um, I, I, I do have a, a, a policy comment on um, our community development uh, budget on page 38 as far as the off hour inspections. I, I would like to, to take a, have us take a hard look at that. And um, some businesses do business seven days a week. Construction and construction management tends to be a five day a week job depending on, on time framing on that. And I, I would like to take, have us take a hard serious look at the way that we allocate hours so that we're not paying overtime to do Friday inspections. Um, looking around town, um, there's quite a bit of building going on. Those are projects that were pre-planned and uh, we still have a significant need for housing units throughout the entire, all of Colorado. Numbers are down, that's what's driving the cost increase of homes. But um, we should be able to look at a rotational situation that does not leave our business owners sitting there on Fridays, uh, not being able to get an inspection, or if they do get an inspection, then we have to pay overtime on that. So if we're gonna look at a uh, rotational situation for our libraries, I think in, in critical, critical areas like um, inspections and in community development with permitting, um, I have long stood by this is that we need to stagger those hours um, and then that would have a different effect on our overtime. So that's just a policy statement on my part. Um, I think we already talked about that. That's, that. That was a couple of the areas. If I have something else, I'll cue back in. I don't want to waste anyone's time for me looking for questions. Thank you. Councilor Scully, do you have anything? Sorry, wrong mute button. Um, you know, just, just high level, I think overall the budget, they did really, you got the staff has done a really nice job with this budget. I think you've kept the priorities straight of public health and safety first and then um, service to our community and um, making sure that we are doing our best to save money where we can. Um, we've had to make just really hard decisions this year. Um, it, it's been an interesting time. I think my fellow counselors would agree to be a city councilor in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and I, it, it's just been really kind of overwhelming to know that, you know, the city's got to take a step back and reevaluate. Um, so I, overall, I think that the cuts were good. Um, I, I definitely want there to be focus on our parks and rec um, because I think that I've seen an, an immense increase of people out in our open spaces. Um, I'm an avid walker and runner out there and I'm amazed at how many people are accessing our parks and open spaces. So um, keeping the art programs, uh, the mobile libraries um, coming on board, um, I think all those are good. I am concerned that we're gonna take our libraries down one day, I get it. it it's a way to save money. Um, the Sunday kind of bothers me. I'm a teacher and um, as a teacher, I know students a lot of times are doing reports on Sundays and that's when they need access to a library for computers and books and resources. So um, I, I wonder if that's the best day of the week. Um, so making sure that we do our due diligence and studying when the most activity is at the library. Um, I'm sure weekends are very heavy. I'm sure certain nights are very busy. Um, it makes me wonder if maybe we could do it differently, like maybe um, opening later and taking out our extra day that way and then staying open at night to the same time. I don't know. I'm not the expert in that, um, but those are just some ideas that I think of. Um, the water main breaks are, have always been such a great concern in our city. Um, and they're all over. It, it's the true indication that our infrastructure is in trouble and we need to fix it. And, and that was largely the reason for our rate increases three years ago was that we knew we had an, infrastructure, an aging and deteriorating infrastructure and we need to have it fixed. Um, and that takes money. 
and, because you have to pay people and pay for resources and pay for um, studies and, and there's so much to that. Um, that has to be our priority, um, but we don't want to be burdening our residents either. We want to make this equitable for all of our residents and make sure that everyone can afford to live here. So um, I really look forward to the water rate workshops coming up in October and November where we'll have an opportunity to explore that conversation more. Um, hard decisions, I'm really impressed. I think, I think overall good decisions. Um, hopefully in 2022, we'll be able to bring back some of these things that got left out of our budget um, because of a need to cut. And so that's where I am. I think I'm kind of babbling. I'm not feeling real great today, so my mind isn't real focused, but um, I'm trying to stay up with you guys, so thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Sykes. Um, so thank you all to who worked on this budget, and I know that really extends to all of the department heads that are listening in and probably division managers um, and employees contributing to a really um, strategic approach, um, department by department, program by program, um, and capital investment by capital investment to figure out how we could do this. Um, I do think it's really a notable achievement that we were able to have this first um, draft of the budget be a balanced budget that does not contemplate layoffs or furloughs. So I do feel like that is a success. Um, that said, I just wanted to take a step back and talk about um, and, and really ask, you know, how this, how the priorities were made. Um, I know at the very beginning of the um, conversation today and in our packets, it went over kind of these were the these were the standards that we considered as we were looking at things. One thing I didn't see on there was alignment with city council's vision. Um, and strategic plan. And I recognize this council as a body didn't really get to have a full strategic planning session. And so there may be some concerns about where all of us overlap and which strategic plan goals from the previous council still are relevant today. But the good news is we came up with a unanimous vision statement. And this budget, I feel like, really knocks it out of the park in one of those areas, which is making sure we have safe neighborhoods. I really do think that this budget is very safety focused, which is wonderful. We need to, you know, that, again, is a foundational. You can't have a high quality of life if you don't feel safe um, to live, to, uh, to travel, or to work in our community. So it is, that is foundational. Um, but I have to, I left this budget wondering, um, about the emphasis on some of those other areas that we talked about, um, sustainability and inclusivity, um, feel like they have not gotten the same level of emphasis. And in fact, um, maybe they weren't even valued as real priorities at all. Um, seeing such low dollar items taken off um, without an immediate plan to, um, to replace that public value that they were providing. So that, that was a little concerning to me um you know i like that we've really upped what we're um contemplating for open space acquisition um i have some concerns that what i heard articulated as far as focusing on where those acquisitions would be made was solely based off of linkages um, with our existing trail system i thought we had been very clear during the um previous uh strategic plan uh, meeting and council protocols that we wanted regional equity, equity to be something we were focusing on too. And so I just really wanna make sure staff is clear, that is very important to me that we have open space access throughout our community because there are, I'm lucky, I can walk out my door and I can be on the Big Dry Creek Trail. Not everybody has safe access to open space throughout our city. So I do wanna make sure that that's one of the lenses that we're looking at. Um, there can't be any sacred cows looking at this budget, even my favorite things. Um, but with this renewed commitment to sustainability, seeing that as one of the things that our citizens and our citizen um, surveys really valued, um, I was surprised to see that the sustainability plan was taken out of the capital program. 
I recognize there's 110,000 still in that budget, but I think we're still looking at sustainability as a one-off or just environmental instead of the lens of how we're supposed to provide our services. Um, COVID's been terrible, right? Like it's, we have year after year gaps that we're having to close, but there is an opportunity for us to think about how we're doing business and improve it. And, and so I just, I really want to make sure that that is being, um, that is the lens that we're looking at all of our programs through, and it's not seen as a one-off. Um, so the recycling centers, the sustainability plan, the libraries, um, you know, I get that we had a usage um, model, we, that we were really monitoring how they were usage, used in attendance, uh, attendance. That all changed in March, right, when we had COVID. So A, they were closed for a while, but the digital divide in our city and in our country is really emphasized right now. It is dramatic. And so children who do not have reliable access to, to um, the internet, it is going to really have an impact on outcomes. And so I had mentioned at the beginning of COVID, I would like to have seen more hot spots around our city where people could go with internet access. And I know that was met with some like, why would that even be helpful. It doesn't seem like it would help enough people. The data is clear. It is very helpful to have access to the internet. And so when we close those, we can't say, oh, well, we have digital offerings. The same people that benefit from being in the library are the same people who won't benefit from digital offerings. So I just really want to look at this holistically with how the needs of our community have changed after COVID. Um, this council, and I want to give credit where it's due, Councillor um, Scully and Councillor DeMont have really talked about mental health. Um, and I think mental health, it's, it's a good thing to work on, right? It's a, there, there's a public value in working on mental health, but there's also a cost deterrent. I think um, mental health issues, they impact our, our EMS, they impact our police officers, they, imp you know, they impact a lot of things, they impact our schools. And so I worry about losing some of the rep programming. Um, I worry about, again, the MAC and some of those things um, because there's certain populations that really benefit um, from having those city resources available to them. Um, so, you know, I'm really happy with this. I recognize maybe those were your priorities and, you know, I'm sensitive to it and I didn't see it um, translated the way I would have liked here. But when I looked at what was approved and what was cut, I felt like there had been a disconnect between the policy mandate we had given. So that is, that is my concern. That said, even my favorite programs can't be sacred cows, but those are the ones that are giving me heartburn. And I'd like to have some better understanding of before I'd vote on this. Councilor Bowles. Thank you, You're Mr. Up. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Uh, I, I share the same concerns as Mayor Pro Tem Sites. I, I think we've done a really good job on the public safety side. I think it, it's not part of our vision statement, a safe neighborhood. I think we've done a, a good job. And I think we've, to our credit, I think, or to staff's credit, I want to you know, thank staff for the work that went into this, um, even delivering these packets to our home. I, I thank you very much for everyone who worked on that. I do believe, though, that sustainability and open space, which is also uh, in our vision statement, didn't get as much attention. And that's why I asked those questions earlier. We were doing that. The question part, I think 1.4 million in open space land acquisition is a step in the right direction. So I only support that and I think that's really good. I also support having libraries open every day. I think that's a resource to a certain population, whether it's new elderly people. Um, I just think it's it levels a playing field is very important. So I would I like the answers on that. I, I want to support that. Um, I think Mayor Putin Sites asked about the turf buyback program and if we don't have that, I think we need that. I mean, right now, I, I thought I heard we had it and that it seems like now it doesn't exist. I know, I've, I think I've even talked about it. So if it doesn't exist, I need to know more about that. But I, I would like to see that funded if it's not. I think that in this time of concern over water rates, to not have that, I think would be not good. Um, recycling centers, I asked that question earlier. I know Mayor Protein Sites mentioned it. And then, I think I don't want to see that reduced. I think that's something in our community that does offer um, sustainability and is 
valuable. So I would like to not see that re reduced. Um, the parking management fund, I know I keep bringing that up, but I would like to know if this is maybe not the year to do that. It looks like it's almost $800,000 to get that up and running. Maybe this isn't the year to do it. Maybe we study it, look at it, do it next year. We're a little, if we're gonna have to transfer 800,000 in general funds to get it, I understand the whole point of getting up and running and eventually it pays for itself and covers its, the fund is self-contained with revenues covering staff and enforcement and all of that. Maybe this isn't the year to do that. So I'd like to hear a little more about that at some point. Do we want to postpone that for a year? Um, just the fact that we may not have the money to, that may not be the right expenditure in this uh, budget crisis we're in, or not budget crisis, but crunch. Um, I think that covers a lot of my points. One thing, I, is there any consideration, I know um, Councillor Seymour had mentioned the uh, off hour inspections, and that also concerns me. So I think some approach to that would be, would be, I think that's a good way to look at that. Have we, do we ever pass those along with fees? If you need an inspection, we'll get an inspection to you, but there may be an additional cost. I mean, if we don't want to hold up a project, but also should we pay for that? So I guess a whole, maybe a series of ways of looking at that. I think we need to be uh, entrepreneurial and kind of a little, look at that in a way that maybe there's a fee that if you need someone on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, you can have it. And we don't want to hold up your project. However, it may cost a little more, or there may be a cost to do that, um, to have an inspection. So I don't know if that's a possibility or if we've ever looked at that or if that's outrageous. But um, again, thank you for all the staff who worked on this. I probably will have more. So I, I guess we have a chance to weigh on this many more times and I'll probably have more questions that I'll email into staff at a later date, but thank you for listening and uh, thank you for all the work that went into this and I appreciate the way it was laid out and, and the time you spent on it, so thank you. That's all I have for now. All right, I'm gonna check one more time to give everyone a chance that either, if they forgot something, uh, Councilor DeMond, I'll start with you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, two quick things that I just wanted to mention. So we, a couple of us talked about the municipal court. So just as a follow-up, I would like to hear more about where we're at with that. I remember a couple of years back talking about potentially the reuse. So I'm glad that we're still thinking about potentially reusing a building in the city because there are a lot of good properties that could potentially fit that. And I know that um, I had conversations with Don and John Hall in the past about that. So I'd be curious to know kind of where that's went because it's been a while since it's been addressed. The other thing that I would be curious for staff to potentially look at, um, you know, is listening to my colleagues about um, accessibility, some of these certain things. So I know that prior to me being on council, the council before that worked really hard to do like the large item pickup. Um, and that really serves a certain populations of the city that maybe, um, you know, that's not always accessible to people. So I'm curious if maybe there's an in-between on that program that we could look at maybe the city not funding it, but still partnering with that same group at a at a greater cost to the resident. So at least that it's just um, a service that we do still at some interval. So I'd be curious to hear more about that to see if maybe there's potentially something we could do to op offset the cost and make it a higher cost, because I know that was one of the things they did when they brought it back is it, instead of it being at no cost to the residents, there was some cost. So um, maybe there's potential to continue that program. Um, so that was the only other thing I wanted to mention that crossed my mind as I was listening to my colleagues. All right, Councilor Smith, anything else? No, I think I'll have more. This is my first time around, so I'll have more questions and comments as we move uh, deeper into this. But I think what's been uh, discussed is is good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Any more? Anything else? Hit the wrong button. Uh, no, I'm I'm good for now, Mr. Mayor. Um, great learning process. Appreciate the opportunity. Councilor Scully. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, just, you know, my hat is off to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sites because she always mentions things and I go, oh, that's a really good point. Um, I, I love that she went back to the vision statement and um, asked for more focus on inclusivity um, and um, equity in our city. And um, 
wish I had been the one to say it, but she did. And thank God she did. Um, just really, it, we have to remember to keep that balance and um, to look at, at not just safety is so important. It really is health and safety of our city residents in our city as a whole is important. And, but part of what plays into safety and health is that we are an equitable and inclusive city and it's what makes us great. And so I appreciate that Mayor Pro Tem site said that on the mic. Thank okay. you. Um, good job. Councilor Bowles. No, I don't have anything else. I, I don't really have anything else to add except I want to thank staff again for being here on a Saturday all day and their work on this document, the budget, and then thank my colleagues. This has been a really good discussion. I learned a lot and I heard a lot of really good points. So uh, a pleasure serving with you all and thank you. So that's it. Mayor Pro Tem Sites, do you have anything else? Uh, not at this time. I think this was probably, um, Mayor Atchison um, is the only one who's probably experienced a similar conversation to the budget as this. Um, so recognizing, you know, every year prior to this um, kind of discussion, we've been in very different circumstances and they were more the daydreaming circumstances. What can we do to enhance the lives of our community? And now it is much harder conversation, but a much more important conversation. Um, and so I respect um, all of the work that's gone in to make us, um, it, you know, to help us um, come to better um, decisions, um, to recognize at this point in time what we think we're up against, um, and, and really to allow us to um, prioritize our values. People always say you can talk about your, your values, um, but how you budget really shows them. And I would challenge us to really consider that. Is this, um, as we go into this, are we making sure we're making decisions um, that are appropriate, practical, um, and, and ultimately serve the citizens uh, and the residents rather of Westminster? So um, thank you for everybody. And, and this is the first of, I think, a few discussions on it. So. All right, Council, I'm gonna to try to wrap up the comments then. And going back to page 37 on the administrative reductions, uh, as I posed a question earlier, that we will be paying for all professional license continuum education requirements so that we won't have to have anybody affected by that, but others will be potentially deferred for the time being. Going to page 38, I had questions very much like uh, Councilor uh, Seymour did. And I believe um, Mr. Doerr answered that Friday inspections will still be there. This is for more than just the construction community. A lot of these home improvements that uh, some of us take on ourselves do require inspections and permits, such as water heaters and other things, that we have access to people on Fridays. And sometimes if we're willing to pay for it on a weekend inspection, provided there are staff available. I've looked at the community recycling centers with staff for a number of years, and I understand uh, Mr. Doerr's point is this is just the portion of an employee that may be grabbed up for the day to go clean up. But a lot of the issues they've run over there is the majority of those that we've surveyed in the past are not Westminster residents. They come from Arvada, Broomfield, and others. But also it's the amount of hazardous waste that ends up in those recycling centers that we then have to pay the extras plus potentially get somebody exposed. So I can fully understand that. We do have a lot of options today to getting rid of junk and stuff around your house that weren't available when we set these up. I got junk, other places like that will come pick up most everything you want for a fee. Uh, that would also get us out of potentially having employees out cleaning up stuff that they don't know what to cleaning up. On page uh, 42, the question's already been raised about the uh, traffic motor units. I did hear a confirmation that we are not eliminating motorcycle officers, but reusing them into a different type of vehicle. But I also heard that we were looking at not backfilling one retiree in a canine unit. I need to understand that that's not an impact on what we're doing with our canine units as well. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more information about the switch. I know there's a cost 
on the motorcycle units with a number of spares. The cops are taking these homes. They do a lot of the maintenance at home themselves. I'd like to understand a little bit more about that. Large item cleanup. Uh, as the council may remember, we've only been able to find one uh, vendor that has been willing to do this. We've had to supplement the cost of that at a pretty high rate. I understand what uh, Councilor DeMott was talking about is that try to raise that rate, but even if we double that rate, we'd still be subsidizing. But we also have, again, we have services that are available to pick up the large items. A lot of it is, especially in the appliance area, that people will pick those up to get the parts and pieces and the uh, fluids out of them to recycle, because especially the older units, that Freon is extremely important. But for washers and dryers, but we also, on a large item pickup, remember, we don't pick up construction materials either, even when they do that. I needed a clarifying question. I think I've gotten it already on page 46. This has to do with property and liability fund. That increase is those that we see as uh, files of claims that typically go through the SIRSA reviews. I didn't understand that uh, fully at the flank, but I think I figured it out. Uh, that, that's all it is. We expect to see more potential from there. I originally had a question in the uh, human resources if uh, outdoor lab was still going to happen. I have confirmed with Jefferson County, outdoor lab will, stay, will still take place in the school, current school year. Let me find my other page. Um, page 69, there's $271,000 currently still in the fund. This is for the Armed Forces Tribute Garden. We have three of those that are now basically complete awaiting installation. One of those was fully funded through Ball Corporation. The other two are this, uh, coming from Westminster. We did have a gentleman who originally claimed that he was going to finance two of those that person has withdrawn that offer uh, for his own reasons. So we still have three of those. The 271 does cover partial, but I know a number of groups and myself included are still trying to find donors for the remaining dollars that we need to finish out those six. Uh, if there was an insurance agent around that anybody knew of that would maybe go to the state insurance policy board and see if they're willing. I know they have a lot of vets in their groups and that, that they insure. Not pointing out any names. I had two other pieces that I was concerned about. Based on the feedback that we've had from, from residents around this area, and this is specific to the rodeo market, we've got almost $900,000 set into a building that people haven't been real enthusiastic about accepting the restaurant uh, Irish pub into. I'd like to understand that if there's not a better chance of asking that gentleman if he'd be willing to relocate that proposed site over to the Westminster station and become part of the retail group there. I'm not sure that at this time it's a good need to put close to a million dollars into a renovation of a building that the neighborhood has not shown that they're all that enthusiastic about to start with. I would also go to the MAC the MAC currently right now is being used primarily for the distribution for the growing home. And that looks like it's going to go into next year as well, and possibly quite a while into next year, depending upon the economy. I have a problem saying that, that I want to go put renovation into that portion of the building when we're not really using it for its intended purposes. But then to look at a quarter of a million dollars to put into a theater area in the area that's going to be vacated sometime next year by Highland Hills, I have a problem in looking at putting that in in 2021. If there's a future demand for it beyond 21, that might be a different story, but I just don't see that there's the demand or the need to put together a theater area with the economy and the base it is today. I would ask staff again to relook at those. Those are my comments. For the closing piece staff, there is an exorbitant amount of hours that you guys have put together in getting this to this point. Unfortunately, you're not done. Uh, we will be back on October the 5th uh, as council. Uh, I'm sorry, September 28th and then October 5th. So there's still a couple of rounds. There's a lot of uh, questions that have been asked by council for you to look at. 
to get more detail and data on. As soon as you have that information available and can get it to us uh, before the 28th, that would be helpful so that people have time to relook at the questions that they ask or the items that they ask you to review. Mr. Tripp, Mr. Doerr, thank you all for the staff time. Thank you for all the work you did, uh, especially here on a Saturday again. But if you've got any closing comments, Mr. Tripp, for your uh, staff, I'd appreciate you doing them now. I'll, I'll have Larry and the deputies. They've got a. They've all got a few comments, and then I'll close. Thank you, Lou. All right, Mr. Doerr, if you would, please. Aaron Council, thank you for your work today. We intended for the second half of your meeting today to be just that, uh, <clears throat> for you to uh, share your analysis, thoughts, and feedback. We've just got a host of things to follow up on. I won't recount them here. It'll take too much of your time. We've got them all. We've got a few people taking notes. We are scheduled for October 5th. I want to look at that agenda and make sure that we've got an appropriate amount of time to respond to these uh, various matters that you've set forth. Again, thanks to uh, all of you uh, and everyone in the audience who contributed to this uh, city manager's proposed budget. Um, and that concludes my comments. I'll invite uh, deputy managers uh, Opie and uh, Jody Andrews to make any comments that they would like. Thank you. Ms. Opie, if you would, please. Thank you, Mr. Doerr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted uh, one clarification. I, I was mistaken when I had said that we did not have a trip back for IBAC program, so I do apologize for that. Um, we'll provide additional information um, with Mr. Doerr's um, feedback in October, uh, so we'll provide some additional information there. I do apologize for that misstatement on my part. We do offer it through the Resource Central um, group, and uh, that is available for residents. Other than that, I do want to thank City Council for all your time and effort this afternoon. This has been very helpful for us. We look forward to circling back with you back in October. And if you have other thoughts or questions or concerns in the meantime, please do feel free to share them with us. Uh, we can certainly try to incorporate that to prepare for the October 5th um, meeting as well. Thank you so much. Mr. Andrews. There we go. Um, we've all been here uh, with you today. So thank you very much for your uh, um, guidance and direction. Um, I can assure you that we've been very busy um, during this discussion and we'll continue uh, afterwards as well to make sure that what we've heard today uh, is uh, is thoroughly reviewed. Um, we do intend to um, bring back to you um, the options that you've asked for uh, us to look at, uh, all, all of your questions to be answered, and we do anticipate that we will be uh, able to present a, a budget package that will incorporate uh, your direction that we've heard today and that we'll continue to, to hear. And I am optimistic that we will uh, get to a budget that reflects City Council's preferred budget uh, for 2021. So thank you all for that very much. Um, a couple of uh, very quick follow-ups. Uh, we will get clarity on some of the items uh, raised, um, particularly in my area. And I think that we would, uh, for example, reach out to Councillor DeMott and offer a, a, a session with our IT staff to go through some of the uh, SAM questions that he has uh, with his expertise. Um, and we'll also uh, follow up with you on more clarity on those um, off hours inspections offered through the community development department. And there's a host of other things that, that I commit that we'll also follow up on. So thank you all for your um, guidance today. It's been very, very helpful. Mr. Tripp. You're muted, Don. Apologize, camera on, audio not. I uh, I don't have anything of substance to, to add to what you've just heard. Um, you're going to get a you're going to get uh, responses from us that meet the needs of everything we heard today. Um, by by prior to October 5th, and uh, I really appreciate the feedback that we've gotten. It's been terrific, and I also appreciate maybe a bit of the grace. And we attempted to answer uh, a number of questions here today. Um, which maybe would have been better to push back some of them, but we thought it was really necessary to give our best shot at giving you all the information you needed. Um, so thank you. And uh, again, your time uh, is valuable and uh, we, we most appreciate that. Uh, and I also wanna thank you for being so well prepared. You were obviously, you read everything and you had uh, a good handle on this and having just received a hundred page document three or four days ago, thank you very much for that. Don, I would ask the staff to take a look at the October 5th uh, agenda. Based on the amount of discussion that I am anticipating on the night, 
I would uh, ask you to consider that to be nothing but budget, uh, since that is a study session night. And if we can defer anything, I would def I would prefer to defer it. Oh. Sorry, Don, you were you were muted. We again. will we will certainly report on that next week. I think that's uh, great input. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's approximately uh, 2.40. You've been here since uh, nine o'clock this morning. We appreciate your limiting the breaks today. I uh, hope you had it. I don't know what John was serving for lunch, but uh, I hope you all had a fair, fair share of it. Enjoy the rest of the time you have today uh, and tomorrow, and then we'll see everybody on Monday night. Enjoy yourselves and uh, get some rest. Good night, everyone. Have a great day, weekend, everyone.